Hello and welcome guys. Didn't plan on uploading next chapters of this novel, but demand was loud and clear. Don't forget to show some love to the original author of the novel. Now, make yourselves comfortable and enjoy. This is My Necromancer Class, Chapter 201. As Jay was carried closer to the base of the mountain, he began to think about his next steps. He wasn't sure if he should simply just keep going south or stop by at another village and try to pick up any supplies he could come or not, that there were other villages further south of Losla. In one sense, Losla was on the very southern outskirts of the southwestern region of the kingdom, so it meant that there would be no mage hunters waiting along the way, but on the other hand, any settlements would simply be small hamlets, consisting of a handful of houses, comma, they wouldn't have much to offer anyway, not a name for their micro-villages. Jay made a decision, the safer option is to just keep going south. Besides, the sooner I go south, the faster I can set up some sort of camp or base. He nodded resolutely. With the skeletons working full time, it shouldn't take long to create some kind of clearing in the forest. The sun was beginning to come up, and as he looked around, Jay realized he was already being carried around the base of the mountain on his throne. Stop. He ordered, before jumping down. Looking around, he was now high up enough to see over the trees. For a moment he hesitated as he turned around and looked towards Losla. He didn't say anything, he simply looked. Jay expected to feel something as he gave his home one last glance. However, there were no emotions at all. No emotional outburst. Nothing. He was almost disappointed in a sense. He could see the small hill that the adventurer guild perched on comma though the guild looked so small now that it was like a brown dot on top of the hill. As for Losla, he couldn't even see it. Its buildings were hidden beneath the trees and the rolling hills. Jay didn't notice as he journeyed, but the terrain was not flat at all. The only signs of Losla were some plumes of smoke slowly trailing above it as people woke up and began to warm themselves by their fireplace, or cook their breakfast. An odd smile came across Jay's face as he remembered waking up in his warm bed, watching the elusive mist sheep in the field before getting up for the day. There may have been no memories of good people, but he still had some pleasant memories, albeit small and fleeting. Now, there was no warm bed. Jay was standing in the shadow of the mountain, a chilling wind blowing across his face as he glared at Losla, as if he were a war general plotting his attacks on the settlement and he stood there cold for a moment both physically and in spirit, as the tails of his molotus coat lightly waved in the wind. With an exhale, he knew it was time to leave. He turned his back to Losler and began walking. Move out. He commanded mentally, deciding not to break the silence. The skeletons carried the throne and followed their master. Jay didn't board his throne, but walked himself until Losler was completely out of sight. He didn't understand why, but he felt like he had to do this part alone. As he walked around the mountain, he noticed something strange. On the other side of the mountain was a desert which seemed to follow along the back of the mountain range, continuing to his left and wrapping halfway around the base of the mountain, while it continued to follow along the side of the mountain range to the right, for as far as he could see comma and from where he was looking, the mountain range seemed endless. It was odd to see though mostly because it only continued for a few hundred meters away from the mountain, before the forest suddenly began again. It seemed almost like it was designed, as it was very unnatural to go from a sparse desert to a lush forest. Before crossing the desert, Jay decided to sit down and have some breakfast first, comma thought. It was really just some dried meat, which he had to slowly chew his way through. MMM delicious Jay smiled, glad that he could make more of it and have at least one creature comfort. He might be living in the wilderness for the time being, but he still knew how to make some good jerky. As he ate quietly, something began to happen in the desert sands. Movement. Before his eyes, some small black points began slowly emerging from the desert sands. Jay stood up, prepared to flee or attack, but to his surprise, all the small black points disappeared into the sand again as they responded to his motions, and it looked as if they were quickly sucked back down by something below. Ha! Huh. He squinted. He waited for a moment, but nothing happened. Jay quietly sat back down again, and kept watching comma he made sure all the skeletons stood still too. After a few moments, it began to happen again. The black tips pushed their way out of the sand slowly. This time, Jay didn't do so much as breath while the black points rose. Slowly as they poked out of the sand, it was only up to Jay's knee, 
then his hip, then soon enough it was much taller than him, about twice as tall. It was like a whole forest of these little black points poked out, as they covered every part of the sand without leaving a single gap. At first they looked like triangle shapes, but soon enough, they revealed that they were actually arrow-shaped. A white shaft with a triangular head. Suddenly, they all stopped growing. The next thing they did almost caused Jay to jump and choke on his breakfast. In an instant, all of them opened up like umbrellas, and created a puff of wind around their bases, lightly blowing some sand around. They were like a field of mushrooms. But this was where the resemblance ended. Below them hung some strange tendrils with a thumb-sized red fruit at the bottom hanging just above the sand, but not quite touching it. Jay couldn't help but lick his lips as he saw the red luscious fruits. They seemed to be almost bursting with juices. Still, precaution was always necessary, and Jay waited and watched. But it seemed like these strange giant desert mushrooms were just happily absorbing the morning sunlight. Hum. Okay, then he shrugged, standing up. This time, the mushrooms didn't retreat back into the soil when he moved. Oh, he squinted, perhaps they're only fragile when they're rising up, he guessed. Jay was about to send a skeleton in to investigate. But on the other side of the desert, there was more movement. A glade deer emerged from the thick, still dark forest. Jay could tell the deer seemed startled and frightened as it panted. It paused for a moment as it saw the strange desert covered in giant mushrooms. But it quickly skipped right into the sand, and began weaving through them. It nimbly hopped between the mushrooms, and soon, behind it there was movement. The shadows shifted as something large appeared at the edge of a forest comma clearly. It was what made the deer so startled. Jay ducked behind a rock and kept watching as he saw the large green and red predator emerge, comma, but something wasn't quite right. The large beast stopped at the edge of the sand, not daring to even step on it. Its large head looked down at the sand for a moment before it gazed hungrily at the glade deer while glistening drool globbed off its jaws. The predator itself wasn't what caught Jay's attention though, but it was how it acted as it came to the edge of the forest and watched its prey. Hum Jay gazed, it won't step onto the sand. But why? There was something sinister going on that even stopped a savage beast in its tracks. Jay could tell it was tempted though, as its large clawed paws thumped around the edge of the sand. It was barely holding itself back from charging into the desert. Suddenly, the deer, which was jumping between the mushrooms, was cooing and crying, as something tugged on its fur, and stopped it from getting further away. It's fatal mistake. It touched one of the red fruits. The red fruit didn't look sticky at a glance, but once it touched the deer's fur, it seemed like it burst and created a red patch on the fur, comma though still connected to the hanging tendrils of the mushrooms. It pulled and pulled as its own skin was pulled tight but it seemed like it wasn't coming off no matter how hard it pulled. Jay thought the deer's skin was more likely to rip away, before its fur was free of the strange, sticky red fruit. The deer cooed and cried as it hopelessly tried to get free, but its struggle only made it jump around aimlessly in a panic, comma, but to its demise. It was only tangled up further as more and more red fruits stuck to its fur. Soon enough, so many were on its fur that it could barely move around as the tendrils of the mushrooms became like strong ropes anchored to its hide. Chapter 202 Jay watched silently from the other side of the mushroom-covered desert as the helpless glade deer was tangled up by the hanging red fruit of the mushrooms, comma, though he was mostly focused on the large grey predator chasing it. It could easily catch the deer now. So why doesn't it want to touch the sand? Jay wondered, but soon had an answer. Slowly, the deer was lifted into the air, comma, the tendrils attached to the fruit were being reeled into the mushroom caps. The deer whined as it was stretched and pulled tight between two of the mushroom caps, and as its body was pulled, it began to make pitiful noises which sent shivers up Jay's spine, no longer even sounding like a deer. Jay watched on in horror as the worst slowly happened before his eyes. Some animals were barbaric, but this was something else. It was uncaring brutality. Strangely a part of him, a deep dark part within the depths of his mind almost seemed to be excited. Jay shivered, pushing the strange excited feeling deeper, suppressing it before it grew, and could possibly get him to agree with it. This could have been my fate. He clenched his jaw. The deer squired as it was pulled tighter, and almost seemed to spasm for a moment, but something suddenly popped and dislocated under its fur, 
Next, the fur was ripped open, slowly and mercilessly. The deer was probably comma hopefully comma dead by now, so it would have been spared from this pain. After each mushroom cap had ripped the deer into two parts, it tucked the flesh under its cap. The mushrooms then folded back up and went back under the sand. Finally, silence. The beast stared at the side of the forest, and Jay just stood there watching from the other side of the desert. He could only stand in awe as he looked at the numerous mushrooms covering the whole desert, for as far as he could see. How many animals died to make a field this big he had a stern look as he gazed at them. The large grey beast did a small grunt and returned to the forest. It seemed this had happened many times before and was simply used to it. Thankfully it didn't notice me though there is always a chance that it pretended not to notice me. It could simply be watching me from the depth of the forest. He thought, still looking for any signs of moment. Maybe I'm just being paranoid he shrugged. Anyway, time to test the red fruit. He added, well, who wants to go first? Jay looked around at his skeletons. Of course, a sly smile came across his face as he looked towards Sweeper. Before sending Sweeper off into the mushroom field, Jay made sure to take its weapon from it. He didn't want to waste another. Go. He smiled. After losing its weapon, Sweeper seemed to lower its head as it entered the field, comma though Jay didn't leave it without options. He gave it a small stick which he snapped off a small withered bush. As Sweeper drew closer to the first mushroom, it poked one of the red fruits with the stick it was given. Strangely the red fruit bounced harmlessly off the stick. Oh Jay thought, so maybe it can sense living from non-living. Seeing no reaction, Sweeper then poked it with its undead bone finger. Jay couldn't tell before, but the fruit actually wasn't sticky, comma it actually seemed to explode and cover whatever touched it in a red ooze, which then seemed to grow rapidly grow across the bone finger, traveling up the hand, and even reaching to the wrist of the skeleton. Well, no wonder the deer couldn't escape. Jay thought as he watched it. Jay had Sweeper try to slash at the tendril connecting to the fruit, but every time it swiped, it was like it slid across the tendrils harmlessly. Jay pragmatically sent Handy in to chop off Sweeper's hand. Despite having hundreds of thousands of skeletons, he didn't want to foolishly waste resources. Something felt wrong about it. Ironically, when I was a butcher, I would save the meat and discard the bones Jay thought, as he watched Sweeper's hand getting chopped off with a smile. Soon though, his mind drifted to why he got a class at all, and how he had to flee Losla for his life. He silently stared into the wilderness as he looked over the desert, the wilderness won't hold me forever. I will be back someday he promised himself. Despite the skeleton hand being detached, the mushroom soon vanished under the soil again, claiming its worthless prize. Hum, but sticks are dead, and so are bones. I don't see the difference Jay wondered, maybe the skeletons have a type of life force. For some reason, the mushroom fruit had no interest in the wooden stick. Okay, test number two. Jay said. Sweeper didn't nod, but it accepted its orders as it rushed over the mushrooms, and stuck its vambrous onto one of the hanging red fruits. Similarly to before, it attached and grew onto the piece of the spectral armor in an erratic burst of life. So armor doesn't block it. Somehow it senses through the armor. Again, Sweeper had more of its arm chopped off, and was now a one-armed skeleton. Jay had it pick up a nearby rock and touch a red fruit to it, but there was no reaction. Hum, Jay couldn't really make sense of it. The desert wrapped around the tip of the mountain range and kept going for a thousand meters. And as he was at the tip, he could have just walked around it as well, comma, however. After seeing the large gray beast, he decided to look for some other options. As he looked along the mountain range, the mountains seemed to go on forever, as if they were an ancient mega wall designed to keep armies of giants out, and this strange slender desert followed along the side of it, seeming to go on forever too. While the Pertan wolves were easy to kill, that didn't mean that the Grey Beast would be easy. It seems like the mountain range and the desert mushrooms act like natural barriers against whatever beasts are in these forests, and must have been what made Lossla safe for so long. Jay gloomily stared into the dark forest. So basically, there's no telling what lies on the other side he continued to gaze into the dark forest. It seemed relatively calm, even peaceful, but in Jay's mind, it felt like he was standing on the edge of an abyss, and was about to jump in, anything could be waiting on the other side. Although it was quiet, he now felt like he stood out like a beacon, and was probably even being watched by things in the forest at this very moment. 
There was no telling what level the beasts beyond the desert could be, or even if they were simple beasts at all. There were other stronger nations which could have wiped a strata out, and made humans extinct. But they had to spend most of their military resources dedicated to holding back wild beasts, among other creatures, imbued with dark magic or mana. Still, Estrata was not free from the endless assault of unknown creatures, ever wandering out of the wilds. There were even areas within Estrata called Dead Zones, where creatures claimed land, and were either too powerful to remove or simply not worth their time. As Jay looked across the desert, he believed that he had until nightfall to make a choice, as it seemed that the mushroom retracted at night time. Sure, crossing the desert would be easy, but he wanted to test out the strength of the beasts on the other side, before making the journey. He was stepping into the unknown after all. As Jay looked around and thought about what to do, he noticed something under the mushrooms moving in the sand. They were hard to see at first but it seemed that there were some creatures lurking beneath the surface of the sand. Small bumps of sand rolled backwards and forwards between a crack in some rocks near the edge of the desert and the mushrooms. Looking closely, Jay saw that a small red fruit would be periodically plucked off and pulled under the sand, before whatever it was picking them would slip back under the sand, and enter the small crack between some rocks, leaving behind only a slight impression in the sand. How they can pick the fruit. Jay's lips curled as he watched these underground creatures smelling an opportunity. Chapter 203. Jay watched the small creatures scutter under the sand and pluck the sticky fruit off the mushrooms. For whatever reason, they could safely detach the dangerous red fruits from the giant mushrooms, undoubtedly stashing them away somewhere for their future food source. With all of this in mind, Jay began to plan his next steps. Weird little creatures okay. I'll walk along the edge of the desert and then cross, sending the skeletons first. Hopefully I can avoid whatever that grey beast was he nodded. I'll leave one skeleton here, so it can alert me if the grey beast actually walks around the desert. The skeleton which Jay chose to stay behind. The choice was obvious. Sweeper close quote, Jay pointed to a large rock, wait there and keep watch. The poor skeleton slowly climbed up the rock face having some trouble with its one arm. Jay decided not to let Sweeper eat bones to heal, as it was going to be left behind to watch Jay's tail. It would simply be a waste. Hum, maybe I should make this a regular practice. Sweeper can be like a rear guard of sorts, comma, or at least an early warning system. For when it dies he smiled, giving his arm a good scratch, as it had been itching, since he came closer to the desert. Sweeper had clambered on the rock and was looking around like a sentry. Jay sat back on his throne and was carried along the rocky slope between the desert and the mountains. After traveling for a few hours between the natural narrow passageway between the mountain and the desert, the air became quite dry. At this point, Jay's arm was only getting itchier, and he focused on trying not to scratch it through the molotus coat. It will only itch the more I scratch it, he thought, as annoyed as he was tempted. Thankfully, Jay noticed something to take his mind off it as his eyes drifted over the desert. Oh, he raised a brow. The desert sands were shifting frantically, as if it were made from water, comma, there was so much movement under the sand, as it was thriving with more of these underground creatures. Previously there was only a few of them, but here, where the mushrooms were thick, there were seemingly hundreds, maybe even one thousand of the underground animals. They darted about erratically, harvesting the red mushroom fruits, and even making the sand seem like a turbulent river. With so many around to catch, Jay decided it was time for a little hunt as he had the skeletons place the throne down. Now's as good as ever he thought as he sent his skeletons off, still sitting casually on his throne. Each of them slinked off into the sand once more, their bony feet sinking into it. For a moment the skeletons simply stood there watching, comma, they weren't sure how to go about catching something underground as they watched the little mounds and waves of moving sand pass by. It'd be easier if the Helminth was here, Jay thought as he watched the hapless skeletons. After a while, the skeletons began slashing and stabbing at the sand, comma, unfortunately the daggers simply weren't long enough, while the swords were too wide to penetrate deeply. The underground creatures were also going around the skeletons, avoiding them. As for slashing through the sand, it went as well as one might expect. No creatures were harmed in the making of these orders. Jay was shaking his head as the skeletons continued anyway. Comma, they were slowly digging a hole around themselves only to be avoided even more by the underground creatures. 
Jay ignored them for a moment and pulled out a bone pile as he began crafting. His crafting choice, a spear, comma four of them. The two-handed weapon with a slender shaft will give Thanth much needed penetration power. Jay began crafting like usual, forming a long slender piece of molten bone. Contrary to his expectations, it required a great deal of concentration as the molten bone kept wanting to form a spindle shape rather than a long cylinder. He also had to keep it straight while doing so. These two desirable qualities made it harder than a sword or even a shield to craft. After all, he had to keep the molten material suspended in mid-air. Jay made it straight, but each time he did, the bone would pull back and blob to the center. It was frustrating to say the least. The long shaft of the spear was made, and he held it up to his eyes as he looked along its length. He rotated it slowly, and to his annoyance, there were some wobbles as it wasn't perfectly straight. Dammit Jay frowned, it was a small thing, but he was a perfectionist when it came to crafting. He would keep trying until he did it right, and he began to channel his mana into it again, comma though he had an idea to help fix the issue. To keep it straight, he kept it floating at eye level, while making his mana swirl around it, spinning the spear as he looked down its length. Almost naturally the spear shaft began to straighten out on its own, while Jay simply had to squeeze out the center, comma using his mind of course. In a few moments it solidified and was done, and he had a long spear shaft. As for the spearhead, he formed a thick triangular point, similar to an arrowhead, but stretched longer like a needle. Jay didn't want to simply kill the creatures under the sand, but to pull them out too, so he added some backwards pointing spikes to the bottom of the spearhead, similar to barbed fishing hooks. As for attaching the spearhead to the spear shaft, it was as easy as adding some extra bone, some mana, and holding them together. The products fused and became one, and the spear was complete. Jay considered adding some hand grips, but decided it wasn't worth his time. They would be going back into the forest soon, and the spears simply didn't suit that cramped environment. With the spear complete, Jay analyzed his grand design. Bone spear, comma, level 1, 6 damage, comma, piercing, 5% chance to stagger, anti-charge, 50, 200% bonus damage when braced against charge, depending on the speed of enemies, anti-charge, comma, 50 kilograms of stopping power, Lifespan, comma, requires necrotic essence to maintain its form. Current lifespan, 4 hours. As Jay went over the spear, he was surprised it was level 1, though it was his first try. Now that he had the blueprint down in his mind, he could quickly improve it, comma, and as he thought, the next 3 spears he crafted were all level 2, dealing 7 damage, and having a 6% chance to stagger enemies. Jay only crafted 4 spears, one for blue, red, lamp, and handy. Sweeper would have received one too, if it wasn't quietly standing by a rock, alone and defenseless, keeping a lookout a few hours behind them. Jay handed the spears out, and the skeletons soon got to work, stabbing the sand and thrusting their spears violently into it. In a matter of minutes, they had their first victim comma right next to the shade of a mushroom. Lamp had managed to stab one of the creatures, violently piercing it in the sand. It squirmed and kicked up sand in pain. A muffled cooing sound came from the sand as it died before it was even pulled out. 6x. Lamp heroically pulled its prize from the sand as it flopped lifelessly on the spear, gazing at it for a moment before bringing it to Jay. The creature was like a lizard, though it had no tail, and instead of having scales on its back, it had a leathery soft tortoise shell. Its paws had long slender claws which were all parallel and close together. However, the most odd part about it was its head. The mouth of the creature opened sideways, and instead of having rows of sharp teeth, it simply had a beak. A weird sideways opening beak. Jay thought it even looked like two hooves of a horse had been used to replace its teeth, jammed into its flesh without remorse. Its head had no eyes, and on each side of its head were four small holes which appeared to be its noses. Jay couldn't see any other notable features, and it seemed that the creature relied mostly on smell to find its food. 6x. Despite Jay having what he came for, the skeletons were as diligent as always, as they killed more of the sand lizards. A few more cooing sounds resounded before he had mercy on them. Okay, you can stop killing them, now Jay said, and the skeletons returned to his side. While it was easy x, he didn't want to stop the lizards from removing all the red fruits for him, each mushroom having hundreds of them hanging, ready to trap its next victim. The lizards made a noticeable dent in the red fruits. 
but it was nowhere near close enough to creating a way across. However, with a lizard's guillotine head, there would be a way. Chapter 204 After another command, the skeletons retrieved their original weapons again, and Jay had them perform another duty. A new 1,1 they may someday become familiar with. Blue stood idly by as the other skeletons stretched the lizard carcass across a rock. Blue didn't do the dirty work itself, but had Duck do the dirty work in cutting off the creature's head. Such was Blue's nature to delegate tasks to others, and perhaps it would be Duck's nature to perform executions. Contrary to Jay's expectation, Duck's daggers were quickly inserted, piercing its skin with ease. A small splash of blood splattered some of the mountain rocks, and with a circular twisting motion, the head was separated. A headless, tailless lizard body sat on the rock, blood streaming down, making it seem like a cultic ritual. With the head chopped off, Dark also carried out the next phase of the plan. Use the head to go and pick off some of the red mushroom fruits. Jay stood up and walked closer to the sand, watching closely. He was counting on this working to cross the desert comma otherwise. He would have to backtrack or keep walking along the endless mountain range living off lizard meat and sending skeletons up the cliffs for ice. As the jaws of the dead lizard-like creature were clamped onto the red fruit, it coincidentally didn't explode in an unnatural burst of growth, something in the lizard's saliva made the fruit harmlessly pop off. Jay nodded with a smile, seeing his plan come to fruition, and glad that he found a way across. Dark easily pulled the fruit off, using the lizard's jaws as a sort of clamp. Good, Jay smiled. With that done, Dark dropped the fruit harmlessly onto the ground. Now Jay gazed closely at it, wondering what it tasted like tempted for just a moment. No, resist the forbidden fruit. Jay decided to have Lamp come and grab the fruit to see if it was still active. He probably wouldn't eat it, but was simply curious. Mostly, perhaps he may change his mind depending on what the fruit did. Lamp was here to serve its master, so without hesitation it grabbed the fruit. Suddenly, the fruit burst with juices, and like before, it had unnatural growth, as it covered the skeleton's hand in a red growing mold, which quickly became solid. UJ grimaced a little, imagining that happening in his throat or mouth. Needless to say being suffocated by a fruit would be a pretty pathetic way to die, especially after all the powerful monsters he had slain. Jay pursed his lips with a shrug, oh well. His desire to eat it quickly died, mostly. He then had another skeleton chop off Lamp's hand, and gave it some extra bones to consume, then tried to extract the bones out of the solid red mold, comma to no avail. It seems the fruit somehow grew right into the bones and melded with them. The mold-covered bones were as good as trash now, so Jay simply tossed it into the desert. Looks like we'll need more fruit cutters. Jay said as he had the skeletons begin to gather another two heads of the strange lizards, and repeat the process, comma the other lizards they killed, previously couldn't be found, but thankfully there were plenty of these creatures around, as they were still shifting the sands, so getting more wasn't a problem, it only took a few moments, and two more headless lizard bodies were covering the rocks with more blood, forming an eerie display, finding a mauled corpse in the wilderness was one thing, but finding three headless bodies was something else, comma it was either a sign of a dark ritual, or a message, and in both cases, it meant one thing, beware, do not go this way. In the dry mountain air the blood dried quickly after the headless creatures were drained. Jay carried on happily however, oblivious to the gruesome message he left behind. With three of these heads in total, he was ready to start cutting a way across the desert. But he still had one concern. Were there enemies waiting for him on the other side, lurking in the forest? Feeling a little paranoid as he usually was, Jay decided to send his skeletons across the desert by themselves first, while he waited on his throne, which was set up on the side of the mountain. Of course, he didn't send Red either as he needed his guard. He also decided not to send Heavy across either as it would have a hard time dodging the red fruits in its thick armor, not to mention trudging through the sand where it would sink more deeply. The skeletons entered the desert, and before cutting they made it about 30% of the way across, weaving between mushrooms, before they had to start cutting away the fruits. The mushrooms were more dense in the middle of the desert, and almost overlapped each other. They formed a curtain of hanging tendrils, each with a red fruit on the end. Unlike the mushrooms on the outside, near the forest and the mountain, the ones at the center were also much taller, about thrice the size of the smallest ones. So Jay couldn't simply walk on top of them. 
He wouldn't have trusted them anyway. If they decided to fold up and he touched a fruit, it would either result in a painful amputation or death. The hidden carnivorous nature of the mushrooms couldn't be understated. In the depths of the sands were an untold number of skeletons, and more were added to their number each day. They had claimed a multitude of souls, luring creatures in with their succulent-looking fruit, and had covered the desert for as far as Jay could see. Cutting away the fruit was a slow process, as the skeletons only had three lizard heads, and there were hundreds of the red fruit on each mushroom. Comma though they would only need to remove the ones around the outside of each mushroom and slip by at least. Jay would have made more skeletons cut the fruit away, but he wanted some to be lookouts and remain vigilant for threats. As Jay watched, he began to remember when he first came to the desert and when the sun rose, the mushrooms slowly rose too, revealing themselves from the sand. When he first saw them, they responded to his movement and hid themselves in the sand. But after they opened they seemed to not care. Maybe the tops are the weak point. He scratched his chin, looking across the desert. Testing his theory, he had a skeleton jump onto a mushroom to stab it. He had nothing else to do anyway. Red stood next to a mushroom and helped Dark to stand up. A relatively easy process. Once Dark was on top, it carried out its mission. Stab the mushroom mercilessly. Clink exclamation point tilde. After the first strike, all three of them realized it was pointless. The top was as hard as stone, comma, perhaps even harder, since the dagger helplessly bounced off. Damn, it was worth a try. I guess it solidified in the sunlight. He shrugged. Another thing Jay was curious about was where the underground lizards were taking all the mushroom fruits. And what were they doing with them? Seeing the large quantities of fruit being harvested, he began to doubt it was merely being stored as food. Duck jumped off the mushroom and followed the lizard trails back to another rocky burrow. The sand was filled with more pebbles here, and it seemed that it made it harder to dig through. And once the creatures were inside the burrow, they walked on top of the earth assuming they were safe. Unfortunately, the burrow was too dark to see inside. But it was no problem for the eyes of the undead. Jay used the host skill as Dark crawled onto its knees and peered inside. As soon as Jay peered into the darkness he regretted his decision. Immediately, Jay wished he hadn't seen this gruesome sight. There was a larger creature inside, similar to the lizard-like ones, except without any arms or legs. It seemed more like a slug. Pulsing along its body were puss-filled sacks of white and red, while it crunched on some vile secretion. This lizard had a tail though. It was pumping as it was in peristalsis, and finally a large egg was squeezed out of its fleshy tail. Of course, it still had the sideways jaws with multiple small noses on either side, so it was related to the lizards in some way. Compared to the others though, it was many times larger. It probably wouldn't even be able to leave this rocky burrow. The smaller lizards, if rolled into a ball, were about the size of human babies, comma though this thing was about the size of a plump cow. It laid lazily on its bloated belly, as its jaws slowly opened and closed with drool, as it waited for its next snack. But what was it waiting for? The red fruit. If only it were that simple. Eating the red fruit by themselves was impossible even for these lizards. Before it, as if it was some kind of show or spectacle, or even a barbaric ritual, a smaller lizard waited, shivering before its maker. Meanwhile, many other lizards were bringing the red fruits into the cave, however there was no stockpile here, comma, only the shivering lizard in the midland, the fat queen slug. One by one, a red fruit was brought to the smaller lizard and placed on its body. The red fruits would burst and send a growth of red solid mold over its skin as the creature cooed and twitched helplessly from the pain. The other lizards worked quickly as they added more fruit and in no time, the creature slowly began to resemble a red rock as all of its body was covered. The lizard died, but the vile fruit was ready to consume, seasoned with blood. Jay thought it seemed almost like an evil ritual or perhaps some witch's spell. But as he watched on, he realized it was quite different, although just as wretched. The large bloated lizard rolled forward, and after a few sniffs, it began to clamp its jaws onto the red rock and break off chunks. This was the most grotesque part, as the red fruit rock had a soft inner core, lizard flesh. Sometimes the red rock would tear away chunks of flesh with it, as it shattered, so did the creature it encased. While the queen was feeding, the other lizards would covertly crawl up to her with their mouths open, comma, the pus-filled sacks on the queen would grow and burst on their faces, 
their open jaws receiving a snack, as well as a thick coating of the disgusting sticky liquid. Jay had seen enough. He ended the host's skill with a disgusted look on his face, holding back the urge to vomit. He folded his arms and looked back at the skeletons in the desert, and said I should have just sat here and watched the skeletons some things cannot be unseen. He shivered for a moment as he instantly recalled it. I just had to have a damn look he shook his head. Shortly after his eyes drifted back to the skittering movements of sand going in and out of the burrows all along the desert, a shiver trailing up his spine. How many of these fucking things are there? Chapter 205 Tilda North of J Southern Losla F-O-R-E-S-T-S -E Tilda A mage hunter was standing near a bloody rock using a communication crystal. He was relaying information back to his commander. The rock itself seemed to be practically drowned in blood, as if a titan had slid its wrist and drained its life out onto it. The mage hunter couldn't help but stare at it as held the crystal. This was a lone mage hunter from a group of five, as the others had split off in different directions, as they searched the south and southeast areas of the Losla forests. As a mage hunter, he had seen his fair share of blood from slaying monsters in dungeons himself, some dungeons filled with rivers of blood. After armies of soldiers, mage hunters and adventurers worked together to conquer them, comma, but outside of dungeons. It was unusual to see such a gruesome display of death, and to anyone else, comma, anyone. But a mage hunter, comma, it would have made them uncomfortable, to say the least. Combined with the eerie quietness of the surrounding woods, it would have made anyone feel a little tense. There was something about knowing that you would soon leave a dungeon which left all anxiety about it behind. The horrors within couldn't leave. You could sleep with a sense of safety. Of course, the outside world had its fair share of horrors, but were much rarer, and it seemed he had stumbled across one. Number 2 Reporting I found a large flat rock surrounded and covered in pools of blood. No corpses or tracks away from it. Just blood. Too much blood. Still liquid. Another gruff voice responded a moment later, continue scouting. Proceed southward as planned. Acknowledged. He stashed the crystal away and kept heading towards his target, the tip of the mountain range. Before leaving however he noticed a strange white stone on the ground, easy to see against the dark grey rocks around. Picking it up, it looked almost like it was melted. Strange he thought, flicking it away. It was too small to report. So number two continued on his journey. As a mage hunger, number two knew they were searching for a necromancer, and knew it would require a squad of them to even hold its minions back, comma, however. They now knew it was a human, and only around level nine at that. Number two had been since commanded to only capture Jay. However, accidents happen sometimes. Unknown to anyone else, perhaps even himself, number two was jealous of Jay. Some random peasant in a poor town in the middle of nowhere got a class so strong that it forced him and the other mage hunters to leave the luxurious capital city of Estrata. And not only that, but now he had to march around aimlessly, alone in the wilderness. His pride had never been so damaged. He longed to march around the capital where peasants looked at him with both fear, awe, and hope. Still, this pride is one of the qualities which made him a good mage hunter pushing himself to act lofty and mighty, and to become stronger. Of course, he wouldn't kill Jay, comma, he had his own neck to look out for, and it seemed they were now intent on capturing him. A necromancer had one weakness, and that was when it was separated from its skeletons. Apparently the upper ranks hoped to control it, comma, to control Jay. There were no other questions or comments from his commander, so he kept marching onward. It seems that the other four mage hunters tasked to search the south must have found their own oddities of nature. This wasn't too surprising though, as peculiar things were a common occurrence in the untamed, wild parts of the kingdom. Little did he know that other mage hunters found more intriguing things, such as an abandoned village covered with slime, another found a small hunter's shack covered in claws marks, with a hidden basement that was filled with bird skulls and pentagrams, among other unknown symbols, painted with blood and urine, comma so number two's findings were low on the list of priorities. With a sigh he kept moving, as it was his duty. Compared to the insanely fast running speed with which these black armored hunters were running through Losla, he could only travel long distances at a swift walking speed. The armor itself was powered by the mage hunter's own mana, and the faster he traveled the quicker it would burn. Sure, he could travel a few hundred meters in seconds, but half of his mana would be used up. A sprightly walking speed was optimal, as it used up as much mana as he regenerated. 
Compared to a normal soldier, however, it was still an unimaginable speed to travel at. His energy consumption was also kept to a low level, while he could simply walk right through the vegetation as if it didn't exist. Most variants simply couldn't escape, not due to their power or skills, but due to their slow travel speed. Essentially, they had unimaginable endurance. It was only a matter of time before they caught Jay. Or so they thought. Jay was no normal variant. Not only did his skeletons carry him, he used no mana or energy doing so. He even traveled while sleeping as he was carried at a jogging speed by his undead escort, comfortably sitting on his throne. Their only hope of catching him now was if he decided to slow down. Otherwise, the mage hunters would need to resort to more drastic measures to neutralize this threat. Tilda Evelyn, the lofty PIG Tilda. Evelyn, a regional trade hub city north of Tolgood, which was north of Losla. The lofty pig was a tavern in the poorer side of Evelyn, a little degraded over time, but it still stood, managing to somehow draw in customers. The customers, however, were questionable to say the least, as the lofty pig was unofficially where the miscreants of the city came to drink and plot. The pub was favored by the miscreants for two reasons. The owner kicked out eavesdroppers, hating them for some reason to do with a treasure, and he really didn't care how drunk people got comma as long as they could pay. Hushed conversations, gossip and paranoid squinting stares, always filled the old tavern, giving in a quiet, but tense atmosphere, comma though it was relieved by the occasional drunk who somehow always had enough money to drink even during the daytime. Many would drown their sorrows in drinks, whether they be the last surviving member of their party, rejected from others, tired of fighting, or simply wished to escape some far too vivid memories. Three adventurers sat at a table, comma two of them were fresh, having only touched a minor conduit this year, while the third had become a mentor of sorts, as they had received their class in the previous year. While two of them were fresh, they were considered high level for their age, as they were level 15, comma this was thanks to their mentor power, leveling them in dungeons. So far, it was an easy ride for them, but they also had to repay their monitor by helping with other tasks in exchange. Bounty hunting, debt collection, information gathering, and distribution of some questionable substances and items. Vanderby, the mentor, was hiding a greedy grin behind a stern expression. Vanderby whispered, 300,000 gold, and for a level 9 adventurer, we'd be stupid not to go for it besides. I heard there are more mage hunters coming. We have to move now or forget about it. One of the fresh adventurers wore a slight frown. Van, I don't know about this one. We'll have to go through Tolgard. His face slightly scrunched up in disgust. Relax, Link. We can just walk around Tolgard if we get enough supplies. Vanderby said, looking out of the window. Gazing further up the street was the vendor area, filled with glistening gold-covered merchants buying and selling. A certain fat merchant was grinning as he set up multiple booths for the incoming divisions of mage hunters, making sure his stores were all well stocked. While he did give a 50% discount to the mage hunters, he had also doubled the prices on everything, making young adventurers like the three of them a little more desperate than they usually were. The other fresh adventurer followed his gaze before she spoke up. How about we just hunt along the way? It'll take more time, but we'll save money at least. A dark-haired girl suggested. Vanderby scoffed, who cares about money? Once we catch this guy we'll never have to work again. We could probably even afford a house in the capital comma at least on the outskirts anyway. The girl, Astra, pursed her lips, shrugging as she went back to her drink. She knew what Vanderby was like, comma, once he had an idea, he stuck to it. There was no talking him out of it. Besides, with your ability, we have a good chance. Van smiled at her, and if we catch him alive, the reward is double. He added, whispering a little louder. Link looked around, making sure no one else was listening in before whispering again. What do you think our chances are? Vanderby looked at Estra for a moment, and with a cunning smile he leant closer, 30%. He said with a nod. Link pulled his head back as if he just heard something crazy. 30. Only fucking 30. Vanderby shrugged. Look, it's still a pretty good chance, almost 1 in 3, and it could change our lives forever. Plus, with her skill I really like our chances. He said, trying to sound reasonable. Link shook his head, though with a sly smile he looked up at Vanderby. You'll owe us if this doesn't work out. Vanderby smiled, seeing that they were in agreement, comma, at least in his own mind they were. Of course. He shrugged, finishing his drink, 
But I won't need to because it will work out. Chapter 206. Tilda E E V U L E N Tilda. Vanderby, Link and Estra set out on their journey towards Losla. Their supplies were half filled so they could maintain a moderate pace. Though if they saw any animals crossing their paths, it would certainly be their next meal. So what do you think he did to attract a bounty this large? Link asked. Vanderby answered, no clue. Someone that far out probably has zero chance of offending a royal. Most of them have probably never even heard of Evelyn. Whatever it is, I don't want to know, Estra said. As they walked out of Evelyn, they noted many others buying supplies despite the high prices. Obviously, other hopeful young adventurers had the same idea. A normal bounty would only be a few thousand gold at most, comma, it depended who they pissed off, comma, but even then, they were to be brought in alive, which raised the difficulty of such missions. The bounty would also, usually, be quite a high level. This, however, was a unique opportunity. With 300,000 gold on the line for the dead body of a level 9 adventurer, it was needless to say that the bounty hunters were now like flies to dog shit as they swarmed towards Losler. Even parties of fresh adventurers with no bounty experience were teaming up and taking their chances, and the path towards Tolgard would be more degraded than ever after they all passed through. Vanderbee's group had a head start though, as Evelyn was considerably closer to Losler than many of the other cities in Estrata. Countless groups departed Evelyn, and some of them only had a few meters between the other groups as they marched along the road. Others didn't bother with walking, and simply flew using their magic. There was even one group which traveled in a stone house which somehow sat on top of a large, rolling boulder. Still, Vanderby was smiling, as he had a better chance than all of them, and that was due to one person, Estra. Estra's class was unusual to say the least. After it was discovered by the local adventurer guild, she was locked away, but after some discussion and a few interviews, they came to the conclusion that she wasn't dangerous enough to be classified as a variant. After a few days passed, she left the guild, still as a level 1, comma, but by then, she was simply too far behind. And with her unusual abilities, no one would bring her into their party. She was dead weight. Her only option was to join these two. Coincidentally, her only ability, which was useless in dungeons was quite practical in the real world. Of course, she had gained more abilities since leveling up. As for the ability which would help them find J. Heart Trace. Left bracket you miss your beloved, you long for their embrace and to listen for their heartbeats once more. Left bracket requirements, not met. As for the requirements, she already found that out the day after receiving the skill. Comma, she merely had to sleep in the bed of her lover, though this could be any bed at all. When she woke up, she would have a list of names to choose from, comma, those whom she could choose to heart trace. After that, all she needed was some quiet, and she would be able to hear a gentle heartbeat, in whatever direction her lover was in. Still, she would need to sleep in Jay's bed for this to work, and first they would have to get to Losla. A few times, this skill revealed some more opportunities as well such as when a name of a righteous young noble's name would appear in the bed of an entertainment house. This strange skill was their edge over others, comma, others who would have to rely on information gathering, basic tracking skills, and either heat, life or blood-based mana pulses, all of which were time-consuming and tiring. The mage hunters used the latter, relying on the variant's body warmth, life energy or blood, revealing anything with either of these on a spell-linked map. However, it had its drawbacks, as these couldn't distinguish between human, monster or animal alike, and in the wild Lossland forests which were brimming with life, there would be thousands of signals to track. This also required a specific magic type, and in Lieutenant Marsh's small party, there were not any men who even had much skill with magic. They were low-ranking soldiers who had melee classes. Most of them only used mana to power their armor. The mage hunter's armor shielded them from such tracking. However, the approaching hordes of adventurers and bounty hunters coming to search the forests would only make the forests fill up with even more signs of life, making tracking more difficult. Thankfully, they didn't have to execute anyone, but could simply mark off a signal from their map once they realized it was a person or harmless animal. Tilda L-O-S-L-A Tilda. Losler was still locked down as the mage hunters conducted their door-to-door -door search. No one could stop them, comma, not only due to the authority of the mage hunters, but physically were much stronger. And if anyone tried to resist, 
it would result in an instant execution. A few knocks on the door and one would have to open it, otherwise the door would be smashed to pieces. The mage hunters were simply uncompromising in their duties. Plus, many enjoyed the twisted feeling of power that came from frightening the weak. The Lossler residents were tense and angry, as game hunters weren't allowed to leave. There was no one bringing fresh food back from the forests. It was spring, so there wasn't much to forage anyway. But having no meat still had an impact. Stored provisions left over from winter were slowly being eaten away or perishing. So there was some food around, and the mage hunters at least let the farmers leave to till and prepare their fields. However, food was only a small source of the stress. This was just the beginning. Currently, 35,000 mage hunters were heading towards Losler, each with the authority to do as they pleased for the most part. But a bigger problem was the huge population influx. Not only would it cause soaring food prices, but housing would become scarce and expensive, comma, perhaps even some would be seized for the greater good. The forests would be cleansed of animals for food, and populations of precious glade deer may never recover. The gentle stream which supplied the water, if not polluted, it would be turned into a scarce ration, with the mage hunters given priority. The famous fields which they were not planting, would become barren unless a grand water mage used some rejuvenating spellcraft. Coincidentally, there were nearly no plant mages in the whole of the mage hunter arsenal. As for sanitation, there would simply not be enough hay to process all the human waste into manure. It would have to be burnt by fire mages or simply piled up somewhere. In essence, to the people living there, Losla was going to be destroyed. It was in its last days. Each of its residents were packing their belongings while waiting for the knocks of the mage hunters on their doors, waiting for their homes to be searched. As soon as the mage hunters let them go, the smarter ones were already planning to give up their houses and leave, finding another village to build their lives up in once more, and starting again from almost nothing. The unfortunate ones were the those who were going to stay in Losla, and there were three types of these people. Those kept their heads down, focused on their daily tasks, while they ignored the changing world around them. Those who still thought of the mage hunters as their heroes, and the elderly who were too old to travel alone and had not saved a single gold from their younger years. The shadow of death was on Losler. Tilda Losler, adventurer G-U-I-L-D Tilda. Sir, the guild workers wish to settle back into the guild. They have promised to cooperate. A mage hunter stood before Lieutenant Marsh. Marsh scoffed for a moment, but afterwards nodded slowly. While there wasn't much of a need to run the guild right now, the trade platform which Lillian ran was almost a necessity. Plus, in the coming days, the guild would have to be a fully functioning administration hub for the coming divisions of mage hunters. Besides, the guild would also need to function as an area to form bounty hunting groups, for the latest bounty placed on Jay's head and Marsh certainly wasn't going to organize all of this himself. It was below him. Let them back, comma, but no guards. Only functional staff. All of them are functional except for one, an orphan girl. No one has adopted her. She cannot speak, she's a mute. But I see defiance in her eyes. Marsh hid a sly smile as he replied, Then we will claim her. Another mage hunter for the Saintess Division. Have the functional staff handle her transfer to the Three Sisters. The mage hunter nodded and left with his orders. The Saintess Division was another crafty name made by the political class. A most basic example of weaponized language which coincidentally fooled most people. The division, while named the Saintist Division, was filled with women who were anything but saints. It was simply another flashy, honorable sounding name used to trick the peasants. Sure, they wore shining white armor, and said all the right things in public, but during variant, witch, and mage hunts, they were the furthest thing from a saint. Nothing was off the table for them, and nothing was immoral. Seduction, poison, torture, soul burning, manipulation, human replacement, comma, and this was what they did to innocent peasants, as they searched for clues to carry out their mission. The saintesses who were each like demons when visiting towns, and they even mage hunters, would seem like valiant noble knights. Most variants were often more preferable. Conversations about the saintesses ranged from, oh, they are so beautiful. They're like angels here to protect us too if a saintess comes to your town. Just leave. Abandon everything. In another time, in another part of the kingdom, a villager had said, oh, 
All the mage hunters did was break down your door and break your nose. How very kind. A saintess came to my house in the middle of the night while we were asleep. She stole my child and replaced them with a humanoid golem. I only found out a few weeks later after the spell ended when the mana ran out my child comma at least. I thought it was my child comma turned to a pile of fucking stones. While we were eating breakfast. Or because I gave a variant directions one time the worst part is. If I tell anyone. I'm made to look like a complete fucking lunatic. And no one would have listened to such a far-fetched story. Suppressing the truth about these white armor-clad women, delivering lofty speeches, and using names like saints, were all part of the useful propaganda. In the human kingdom of Estrata, even simple speech was made into a powerful weapon as powerful as any spell. Chapter 207 Tilda the Third Academy, Mirror Reality 30 FOUR Tilda Matheson was sitting in a different room to the dark prison he first found himself in. Functionally it was the exact same. No windows, doors or anything of the sort. The only difference was that this room was square instead of round, and came with a stone table, some wooden chairs, as well as a luminous orb embedded into the ceiling. A small upgrade as now he could see better comma however he couldn't move. His body was encased in a black cocoon of some strange silk he had never seen before, and it seemed to be sticking itself to the wooden chair he was currently sitting on. Probably the work of more variants. He thought as he strained his muscles against the black silk, each time it dug into his skin and threatened to lacerate it. After some time to think in the darkness, he had realized that he had been kidnapped by variants. As he connected the dots, comma though to call it a kidnapping was inaccurate, as he had willingly jumped right into their clutches when he entered the portal. Still, he had no clue what was going on, only that something grand was happening all around him, and it didn't involve him. It was like he was in the eye of a storm. A small part of him still believed there was a powerful treasure to be won, which is why both the variants and the mage hunters were at Lossler in the first place. But as for their success in finding the treasure, he wasn't sure. Either way, he was caught. There was no way he was getting it. Right now, his life was all that mattered. For all he knew, that woman with the gravity magic could still be fighting off mage hunters outside the portal as she waited for something. For now though that didn't matter, he was sitting quietly in the room, silently waiting for wherever would happen next. Once again, his fate was in the hands on others. Little did Matheson know that he was being watched from another location. Norgrim scratched his chin, wondering what he would do as he gazed at a floating projection of Matheson. So, Anya said he's an exiled noble he can't be worth much then. Did you check his class? No. He did have an impressive rapier, so it's some kind of melee class. But we were waiting to see what you would want to do with him. Evelyn said. Hum Norgrim scratched his bear for a moment. He's quite a low level for a noble brat. Seems like they didn't power level him. Evelyn nodded back. It seems that he has leveled himself up, as there were no guardians or servants with him. Quite a hard worker. Norgrim thought silently for a moment more. Alright, leave him with me. He added, and send Sylvia over. Evelyn gave him a concerned look Sylvia. Isn't that a bit she paused, deciding not to say it. I will send her over shortly. She bowed her head before leaving. Sylvia was a microtype magic user, and her class specialized in parasite-like constructs. Due to the nature of her parasites, she was feared at the academy. Most parasites had a symbiotic relationship with their hosts, or benefited without affecting their hosts at all. Comma, these range from harmless to even beneficial for good health and most people walk around with these happily living inside them. Some of these parasites have a specific host in mind, such as a glade deer, and only use other species, such as birds, as a forms of transportation, while they wait in either a dormant stage as an egg, or halt their growth at a certain part of their life cycle, while they bide their time under the skin or in the stomachs of what is called an intermediate host, comma the birds in the example. The next type, which most people feared, were those which lived off their host. This type would kill the host to feed themselves and propagate. However, it wasn't like this type of parasite was trying to kill the host. It simply had to eat. Sylvia's magic was worse than all of the natural varieties of parasites, and she was feared at the academy for it rarely ever did people request to form a party with her. They even felt sorry for the victims of her magic comma despite them being monsters. When she was low level, 
Her magic was only able to summon a single flesh-eating beetle. It would find its way into an oblivious monster's body, feed, replicate, and soon enough, the monster would burst open with these beetles squirming around. Comma though they would soon die as soon as they left the body, as Sylvia was only able to sustain one beetle with her skill level and mana. When Sylvia leveled up though, she's didn't only get more beetles to play with as her powers grew. So did her creativity. Flesh eating was just a start, and eventually she created mana eating. Mind eating and armor eating varieties comma she could now kill monsters which didn't even have flesh. This only spurred on her imagination, and soon she created parasites which targeted certain parts of the anatomy. Nerves. After flicking a small handful of these nerve-eating bugs at some monsters, the same monsters would chase her, comma, but only for a little while soon they would crumple to the ground, crying out in pain as their nerves were chewed away. And as these parasites got to the spine, the monsters would lose the ability to run. They would soon have no feeling in their legs at all. Helpless, they would spasm from the pain on the ground, as Sylvia's parasites worked their way up the spine, every moment one of intense pain until thankfully, they would make it towards two certain nerves which control the heart dot. Depending on which of these nerves was eaten first, the heart would either speed up until it failed or slow down until it stopped. It was as if the monster heart partied too hard in Vegas. Other times, she would simply send one parasite into a village of goblins, comma, over time, each one would be covertly infected without even realizing it. After a day or two, Sylvia would sense that all the goblins had her bugs inside them, and she would activate phase two. In no time, all of the goblins would helplessly drop to the ground, their lungs would be consumed, and they would die without even realizing they were being attacked. Either way, it didn't matter to Sylvia. Causing the pain and suffering of monsters was something she quickly grew used to, and as a third year student, she was quite accustomed to it. However, she did it all for her research, and this wasn't enough. She spent months, almost a year, creating a new parasite which would disable a monster without killing it. This was her first step, comma, first, she had to disable a monster, and then soon enough, with plenty of research, she would be able to control it. Someday she wished to have her first prototype parasite, created two controlled monsters. For now though, she only had one to disable. This new disabling parasite was a revolutionary step for her, comma not that anyone gave her any credit, or even so much as acknowledged her breakthrough. Most didn't even know about it, since no one talked to her. After disabling a monster, she could now study it up close learning the weaknesses in its flesh, so her bug-like constructs could get inside, while live dissection allowed her to learn more of a monster's anatomy, specifically relating to its nerves. Needless to say, the disabling parasite allowed her research to progress much faster. But how did this fit into what Norgrim was going to do? Knock. Sylvia knocked once on the door. Norgrim raised an eyebrow, unsure if the noise was simply the door creaking or not come in. Sylvia opened the door with a cold glare. She was short with shoulder length dark hair, but she created an uneasy pressure whenever she was in a room, as if he was a giant. While he gaze was cold, it wasn't that she was angry. This was just how she was. An old girl, a feared outcast. Most of the other adventurers avoided her and gave her plenty of space. They didn't want to risk catching one of her parasites if they stood too close. Some of the more paranoid students believed that the whole academy had already been infected by her tiny creatures. And if she snapped her fingers, they would all be hopelessly massacred. However, Sylvia herself was oblivious to the fear she created in others. Though she wouldn't have cared either way, as she was focused on her research. She closed the door as she entered the room, and instead of sitting down, she simply stood there right next to it, staring awkwardly at Norgrim from across the room. Hi, she said quietly. Even Norgrim felt a little uneasy, but ignored her odd behavior as he knew what she was like, and that she didn't mean any harm. She was simply misunderstood, like most of the variants were. Sylvia, good to see you. I have a little job I think you'll be interested in. He leant forward on his desk with a smile. Chapter 208. Tilda somewhere near Hollow Forest. Between a long slender desert and cliffs of a sprawling tall mountain. R-A-N-G-E Tilda. Your skeleton has been slain. Huh. 
Jay looked back towards the tip of the mountain range, a sweeper just died somewhere near there. He was about two to three hours away from there, so he was safe for now. However, the skeleton's death only meant one thing. He was being followed, comma, hunted. Damn it, I bet it's that grey beast, close quote. Jay pursed his lips. I guess it noticed me after all. At the time when Jay first noticed the beast chasing the deer, he had hid behind a rock, and he didn't even see the beast look his way. But it seemed that this was simply a ruse to give Jay a false sense of security and let his guard down. Fortunately, Jay was a paranoid person. Jay summoned Sweeper again. Instead of crafting a new weapons, he made Red give it the bone spear he recently crafted, while Red reclaimed its sword. Originally, Sweeper only had one arm and no weapon when he left it on lookout duty, and Jay didn't expect it to live for long. But now it was armed, comma, both with a weapon and with literal arms. Jay believed it wouldn't be long before he received an experience point notification of the Persing Beast dying. After all, most things outside of the dungeons near human settlements were low level. The spear itself would be useful against a charging beast too, as it had the anti-charge ability. With a weapon, Jay sent the skeleton away and Sweeper quickly sprinted off towards the direction of its death, as if wanting to get revenge on its killer. The rest of the skeletons were either guarding Jay or using the chopped off lizard heads to pluck away the dangerous fruits. Jay sat down and watched the fruit picking process, unalarmed and unconcerned with the beast on his tail. It was a little over two hours away, so there was plenty of time to deal with it. For now, he relaxed and rested from the journey, and despite the undead using bloody lizard heads to pick hazardous fruit, there was something calming about watching the fruit picking process. Two hours later and Jay got another notification. Huh. He raised an eyebrow, stretching a little as he stood up from his chair. Your skeleton has been slain. Sweeper perish again. Hum okay. He shrugged, summoning Sweeper again. There were still three spears left, so Jay sent Sweeper away with another one. Surely it will be close to death by now. He thought as he watched Sweeper sprint off across the rocks once more. Jay wasn't sure how powerful the beast stalking him was. But most of the wild creatures out here were below level 5. Comma, even the weakest natural animals like the glade deer didn't even have levels, meaning they had no class or powerful skills. While the highest level enemies he came across so far were the level 2 pattern wolves. His guess was that it was around level 8, since it could kill a skeleton. There was a chance it could have bled out before even reaching him, in which case Jay would just have to wait for an exp notification hopefully sometime soon. For now though, he would just have to wait. The fruit picking skeletons had made it nearly halfway across the desert, slowing down, as there were many more of the fruits to pick in the center among the larger mushrooms. Jay leisurely looked at Heavy and Red by his side, all three of them had nothing to do. Well, I might as well try that new skill out. Hopefully it's as good as Mark and Host. He nodded with a solemn smile, remembering Sedulous for a moment. Jay checked the skill once more before proceeding. Mind, comma, level 1, comma, craft a rudimentary sentience. Form a basic mind, comma, 25, mana. All right, let's see what a mind looks like. First, Jay tested the skill by walking away from the skeletons and trying to activate it without any skeletons around. He believed there was a chance of being able to make a disembodied mind, which he would have to implant into the skeletons. And he didn't want to miss that opportunity. Comma, perhaps it would have opened up new avenues of research. Unfortunately, nothing happened. With no success this time, he called a skeleton over. Heavy, you're up. The heavy skeleton trudged over in its thick armor. Jay had it drop it weapon before he got to work. Heavy was chosen over red as Jay didn't want to mess up the skill. While using a higher level skeleton, there was no telling what giving a mind to the undead would do. And if a skeleton were to go crazy and attack him, he would want it to be the slower one, the one he could quickly unsummon, before it could hope to harm him, or even have red kill if it were necessary. There in some uncertainty, as if the skeleton had a mind, there was a chance it could have a will of its own, and even reject its master's will. Nevertheless, Jay proceeded, and removed its helmet before hovering his hands around Heavy's skull, and using the mind skill. Suddenly his necrotic mana left his hands and wrapped around its skull. To Jay's surprise, the mana was glowing much more brighter than usual, even causing it to glow in the daytime. 
while it appeared thicker and more like a turbulent floating liquid, spinning around the skull wildly as if were caught in a storm. The spell drained something from J, something which wasn't energy or mana. His arms got heavier and heavier, but he fought against it, and kept his arms up as he guided the mana to continue swirling around Heavy's head. It seemed that his energy was also being drained by the spell somehow, making the process more like a test of endurance. Perhaps even a test of sacrifice, comma, hopefully it would pay off. While he wanted to lower his hands, he sensed that if he did, the spell would fail, and the resulting mind would be fractured. Jay pressed on as the pain grew, and thankfully, the rapidly swirling mana began to slow down. It went from being like a miniature hurricane spinning around its head to then becoming a rushing river, and soon enough it was like a gentle swirling pond, comma, until finally it stopped. Instead of pain and tiredness, a strange warmth crept into Jay's heart and seemed to reinvigorate his tired limbs. Perhaps it was joy, or maybe gladness. Whatever it was, it was the opposite of the pain and struggle he initially felt, and even made up for it. None of the skeleton's skull could be seen during the whole process, and the mana was still wrapped around it comma slowly though. It disappeared and drained into the center of the skull, revealing the skull once more. Finally Jay lowered his hands as the spell completed. The skeleton stood there, still gazing at him, almost fixated on him as if he was a single star in the night sky. A new mind is formed. Jay looked back into its eyes. They were still little bead-like duck green orbs, hovering in its eye sockets, fueled somehow by necrotic mana. Comma though as he gazed into them. They seemed brighter somehow, interested in and wondering about the world around them. The inside of the skull itself was no longer bone white on the inside. It seemed more like an infinite darkness now, as it was covered by a thick coat of the fluid-like mana, which had since turned black. As Jay looked closer though, his eyes adjusted to the darkness within its skull. He could see tiny little beads of green lights traveling throughout the dark inner coating. Thousands of these little green lights moved backwards and forwards like a swarm of tiny beetles running frantically around its skull. Some moved as fast as lightning, while others traveled as slowly as snails. Jay himself seemed as curious as the skeleton before him. There was something unsettling about its eyes, which seemed more menacing as they were surrounded by darkness now. Its eyes were calculating and gave off a sense of a cold intelligence. Without even reading the notification, it was easy to tell that a new mind was born. Or formed. Jay preferred formed. Suddenly the skeleton's head moved back from Jay, and Jay stepped back too. Its eyes began moving rapidly all over the place, as if it was having a seizure or was in a deep sleep state. Jay waited patiently to see what would happen. Comma, but just to be safe, he had Red stand by his side. After a moment, its eyes stopped shifting around and then began to look around slowly. First it looked at its own skeletal hands, which it clenched a few times comma then at its armor, which it caressed almost lovingly. It then glanced at the helmet by Jay's side, and Jay held it out for it to grab. It took the helmet, slowly rotating it in its hands before putting it on. Jay couldn't help but smile as he watched it learn. Before his was a skeleton he created that was thinking by itself, figuring out its armor by itself, moving without orders. While to others it may have not been noteworthy, it made his heart rise with excitement. Sure, the other skeletons could equip armor, but they were responding to Jay's will and orders. Jay had a theory back in the mist, keep dungeon comma that the skeletons copied or mimicked Jay's thoughts in regards to fighting. That their combat style and tactics were simply reproduced variations of Jay's own ideas buried somewhere in his mind, whether conscious or subconscious. Therefore, their combat skills, knowledge, and everything else, would only be as good as Jay's would be. This skeleton, however, had its own mind. It could learn. It could get smarter. It could outsmart. It could develop its own fighting style and hone it, gain proficiency with its weapons or in this case its heavy armor. For now though, it was like a killing machine with the mind of a child. Even though its threat potential just jumped by leaps and bounds, it knew nothing. For now at least, Though through endless battles and enough time, it would only improve. Finally thinking about his own protection rather than his accomplishment, Jay cut his celebration short. Hum Jay squinted suspiciously as he stood up and moved a little further away. As the next thing the skeleton noticed, was its weapon comma the bone dagger Jay left for it lying on the ground nearby. Well, 
Let's see what you can do. Jay smiled, preparing to fight it. Incas it tried anything. Chapter 209. Curious about what it would do, Jay took out all the weapons he had with him and made a neat display of them on the ground. Heavy looked at the weapons before it, its eyes landing on each one and hovering for a moment before it turned to the next. The weapons it had to choose from were the three bone spears, an Osane sword with a longer grip, and two bone daggers, comma one of which was Dark's. Both Dark and Handy couldn't take their weapons with them, as they were still using the lizard heads to cut away the dangerous red fruits, though Dark could still carry one of its dual daggers with it. Your skeleton has been slain. Ah shit, Sweeper died again. Jay's brows creased in frustration. The untimely death distracted him from Heavy. About two hours passed since the last time Sweeper died, comma, whatever it was, it was getting closer as each time Sweeper died a little more quickly. While keeping his eyes on what Heavy was doing, he leisurely held one hand over the bone pile and began to summon Sweeper again. He barely needed to think when summoning anymore. While the dark, sickly green mana left Jay's hand and mingled with the bones, Heavy suddenly looked up and stared in amazement while another skeleton was assembled before it. Leaving the weapons, it quickly hopped over to the bone pile to watch more closely. Oh, you're interested. Jay smiled slyly, a sense of pride in his voice. Heavy only glanced at him before turning back to the floating bones, which assembled into Sweeper before them. Sweeper followed Jay's next command and went to get another spear. Heavy followed Sweeper over to the weapons, mimicking its behavior. Sweeper grabbed a spear, but this was when Heavy hesitated. Sweeper was about to sprint off. But Jay stopped before it left. Jay was sick of it dying, so he decided to send back up. Another skeleton came back from the sand, grabbed a spear, and then stood next to Sweeper as well. Go, Jay said, a hint of annoyance in his voice. Lamp and Sweeper rushed away to deal with whatever was following them, and Jay was convinced that two of them could do the job. Heavy curiously watched them leave, but was not curious enough to follow. Instead, it turned to the pile of bones and held its bony hand out over it, copying Jay. Unfortunately for Heavy, a level 1 skeleton had no mana, so nothing happened. Jay was pleased though that the skeleton was mimicking him instead of the other skeletons. You can try to summon later. Just focus on picking your weapon for now, close quote. Jay chuckled, pointing at the other bone weapons. Hum, I wonder if it will be able to summon someday, he thought as he watched it. Heavy went back to looking at the weapons, and it finally selected the dagger, comma, the same one Jay had given it originally. The lustreless dagger was suited to its body size. For now anyway, it picked it up and looked closely at the blade, tracing its bony finger along it, before swinging it a few times, and following it up with a few stabs. After a while, it began to add footwork into its thrusts, stepping forwards with extra speed, and striking with extra power. Good, keep practicing. Jay praised it, watching in awe. The skeleton's first attacks were slow and awkward looking, but quickly improved. The skeleton's first instinct when picking up a weapon was to start swinging it, and now Jay was feeling a little inspired. So he decided to craft it a small shield for it too. He had crafted a shield for it previously, but he felt like it deserved something special, which basically meant something he would put effort into. Jay formed another shield-like shape, a triangle with round sides and a flat rectangular top, a classic heater shield shape. Its form was slender and stretched. It came up to the skeleton's shoulder, while the point at the bottom ended at its knees. Jay was about to finish the process, but he made some finishing touches specifically for Heavy. Comma he gave it a thickened trim around the outside of the shield as well, as bulking up its thickness to suit the rest of Heavy's armor. While it was a weighty shield, and was too heavy, it would be suited to the skeleton's size once it leveled up, so it would eventually be able to wield it effectively comma and giving it a shield now. While it was low level, and with a young mind, would be the best thing he could do for its foundation. Or perhaps the worst. After all, Jay was no trainer. He simply thought that the more time it had, the better it would become. Since he had never been trained with a sword, he didn't know that foundational mistakes would be harder to fix later on. Jay analyzed the shield before handing it to the young undead. Heavy Necrotic Knight Shield, comma, level 1. Small. Shield, HP, comma, 25. Armor, comma, 15. Slightly encounter, comma, heavy block, stagger enemy. Then respond with a devastating strike. 5% chance. Block, comma, negate 100% damage from an attack. 
15% chance. Otherwise take 80% reduced damage. Lifespan comma requires essence to maintain its form. Current lifespan. 20 hours. Slightly encounter. Interesting it must come from being a heavy shield he nodded. It's no Deathwalker's sentry, but still pretty good. Jay strolled over and held the shield out for Heavy, who had kept practicing with its weapon, since Jay ordered it too. Here, Jay held it out rather than tossing it onto the ground like he usually did. The skeleton tenderly grabbed it, seeming to have a brighter glow in its eyes as it gazed at its new shield. Jay simply smiled, glad that his craftsmanship was now being treasured. Heavy went back to practicing and swiped the shield a few times. Not like that Jay smiled, shaking his head. Jay grabbed a stick, blocked the damage using the shield. He said before lightly tapping the stick against the skeleton. He tapped it in the head a few times while the skeleton stood there confused. Next, it tried to dodge the stick, then slash at the stick with its dagger, but still hadn't used its shield. Jay finally tapped the shield with the stick, and it was like the skeleton realized its purpose. Before Jay could tap its head again, the skeleton ducked and raised the shield, successfully blocking it. Good. Jay immediately said with a grin. Finally close quote, he thought. Heavy did seem quite stupid, but its mind didn't even exist an hour ago. All things considered, it was actually a fast learner with some sort of residual instinct for combat. Now that it understood, Jay practiced with it a few more times before leaving it on its own comma a sly smile appearing on his face, as he decided that Heavy needed a sparring partner. And the quickest way to get a sparring partner, to craft another mind for one of his skeletons of course. Since the skeletons with a mind could be trusted, now that he knew they would follow orders too, it was time to give a mind to a higher level skeleton. Hum who to pick he gazed across his skeletons. Chapter 210 while Jay realized he could craft a rudimentary mind for each of his skeletons, for the current situation it could turn out bad. Immediately he thought to choose Blue Comma however, there was a beast hunting him, and when a skeleton gained a fresh mind, it seemed like it needed time to learn how to fight again. If all of them gained minds right now, he would be like a sitting duck. Once they gained a mind they lost part of their connection to Jay, and couldn't copy his, albeit primitive, fighting techniques. Mentally. They were more like new babies rather than clones of Jay's mind. Red and Blue were both level 4 and currently needed for protection. While Lamp and Sweeper were confronting the beast, so naturally, Jay chose the next in line, Duck. He was happy with the choice anyway, as he thought the idea of an assassin skeleton was too cool to pass up. He would do whatever he could to advance this particular skeleton, and make it stronger. Duck was currently on fruit picking duty. The skeletons clipping away the red desert fruits using the decapitated lizard heads were a little past the halfway point now, and Jay was fine with bringing Dark back for the upgrade. Dark scrambled back across the desert, kicking up sand as it sprinted towards its master through the mushrooms and all the hanging tendrils. It dropped the lizard head and its other dagger on the ground, then stood before Jay and kneeled following Jay's commandments precisely. Jay was sitting down on his throne this time, with his arms resting on the throne as he began the process. The bright glow of the green mana returned, and from a distance, he would have looked like Lick Lord blessing his skeleton with some kind of power while sitting in his throne. I'll need to meditate after this Jay thought is each time it costed him 25 mana. The process went much more smoothly this time, and Jay was glad he didn't have to hold his arms up. He felt the energy leaving his body too but it would recover in due time. Besides, he didn't need to worry about energy since he was carried around on his throne. Finally, the spell finished. A new mind is formed. Similar to last time, the skeleton raised its head and looked deeply into Jay's eyes. It was like it was imprinting on him, remembering its master's face. Jay gave it a moment, and shortly after the rapid eye movement started again. Jay patiently waited, and finally it stopped seemed to take a while longer that time. Perhaps because it's level 2. He thought with a shrug. Duck. Welcome to the world. Jay smiled. Duck lowered its head again as if in submission to a king, accepting its name. Your weapons. Two daggers. Jay pointed. Duck slowly stood up and grabbed its weapons. Heavy was still practicing its swings, slashes, and blocks but couldn't help but turn to curiously watch the entire process. Jay could tell it was trying to be sneaky. But he didn't mind. Dark, just like Heavy, began slashing its weapons. At first it only used one dagger in its right hand, 
but began to alternate more after Jay told it to use both weapons. Unfortunately, Jay didn't know any combat abilities, fighting style, or combination attacks which could help Dark. The skeleton would have to figure it out on its own. Having a melee class would give him a range of standard melee abilities, along with making it simple to learn new melee skills. But for now all he could do was guess. As far as Jay could tell, the skeletons didn't have melee classes. Either comma despite using melee weapons. Sure, they did have roles when they reached level 5, which Jay guessed were like classes. But until they got there, he would just have to wait and see. I suppose if I learn a skill I could teach them. I would need to find someone to learn it from first though. But I would need to oh what am I thinking. If I found someone they would probably report me or kill me. I guess the only option would be to capture someone. He shrugged. The world has left me with no choice. His lips slightly curled, as if he would even enjoy it. Jay watched the two skeletons practicing for a moment, and made sure everything was in order, before he began meditating to recover his mana. Tilda Third Academy, Mirror Reality Number 34 Tilda. Contrary to her normal behavior, Sylvia was smiling. Are you sure you want me to do this? Sylvia gave Norgram an evil smile. She almost seemed excited about what she was about to do. She asked the question as if it wasn't a question at all. Yes, his only other option is death, comma he would cause too much trouble alive. It will hurt him a lot Sylvia added. MHM, I realize that. He nodded, at least try to not look like you're enjoying it Norgram paused for a moment. Then slightly leant forward and whispered, you do realize you're smiling. I have never seen you smile. He looked concerned. I'm just she looked awkwardly around the room, excited about today. For unrelated reasons, Sylvia said, before she quickly left the room and rushed off somewhere. Norgram exhaled deeply and shook his head, my students are weirdos. He thought, before tending to his desk plant. A few moments later, and someone else was at the door. Knock, knock. Come in, comma, O oh William. Thanks for coming. That's okay. He shrugged with a placid stare, seeming a little downcast today. William, I need you to find Jay again. Norgram smiled. You found him before so it shouldn't be too hard to do it again, right? Ah. Oh, yeah. Sure. I mean, comma, no promises. But I can try. He nodded thoughtfully. Well, good. Norgram rubbed his hands together happily, trying to lift the mood a bit. Any other news? He asked. Ah, uh, there's thousands of mage hunters moving to Losla thousands tens of thousands, William said, sounding bleak and empty. I, I see Norgram pursed his lips. Well, if you can find him, we can save him. He nodded with an unconvincing smile. I'll try. William frowned. Let me know if there's anything you need, comma, anything. We must save Jay. Thanks, I'll try, can I go now? He said, still quite downcast. Norgram gestured to the door and smiled with a nod. He watched him leave and close the door. Weird Sylvia and William both seem like they've body swapped. He shook his head and leaned back in his char. Probably just a coincidence. And not one of the student's powers. A young woman walked into Matheson's room. Despite being 20 she still looked like a teenager. Matheson creased his brows in both anger and confusion. And glared at her. Wondering why she was here at all. Truth be told, he expected a toothless tobacco-chewing 50-year-old gruffy man to walk in with a bag of creatively dangerous tools, all bent and twisted in different shapes and sizes. Hello, I'm Sylvia. She smiled. Matheson didn't say anything. There was something off about her smile, and something in her which made him feel threatened, comma, despite her short stature. Still smiling, she cleared her throat, I'll make it short. I'm going to put a parasite into you, close quote, she said in a voice which was way too happy, as she held something up to show him. In her fingers was a wriggling black worm, which had three sets of insect-like legs at either end of its body, along with some translucent fins running along its back. Matheson's eyes widened, no you fucking won't. He immediately flexed his muscles, using the fear to drive him to push harder against the cocoon. He kept looking at the wriggling worm in her fingers, a tiny mouth lined with teeth, let out a tongue which seemed to start tasting the air. She smiled slyly as she brought it closer. No, you fucking won't, he spat, hoping to knock the worm out of her hands. Matheson then flexed as hard as he could, and to his surprise, there was a snapping noise comma well, more of a popping noise, followed by pain. Grah, get that fucking thing away from me. 
he angrily screamed after his shoulder was dislocated. Next, he leant forward trying his most desperate tactic, biting the worm out of her fingers and hopefully destroying it with his teeth. Of course, he failed. Nothing was ever that easy. Sorry, this might hurt a bit. She pouted for a moment pretending to be sympathetic, but in no time another smile formed on her face as she proceeded with her experiment. She walked behind Matheson and pushed his head forward and slamming it against the desk. She was much stronger than him as a third year student. He was still shifting around as much as he could in a cocoon of unbreakable silk. But Sylvia didn't mind, comma, she just needed access to some bare flesh near the back of his neck. Even Matheson's toe would do, but the closer she got the parasite to the base of Matheson's skull, the less painful it would be for him. It was like a sort of mercy, in a dark kind of way. The parasite's tongue kissed his flesh and then latched on, pulling its jaws closer, and soon it began to dig through his flesh. For the next hour, all Matheson could do was scream in pain. He screamed till he passed out, wake up, then scream some more. By the end of it, he looked lifelessly at the table in front of him, his eyes bloodshot and drool dripping from his mouth, while he shallowly breathed. Unknown to his captors, something changed in Matheson's mind. It was as if a switch had been flicked. He realized he was trapped again, first by his father, then himself, and now here. Finally, a trap he had no way of escaping, the parasite. Weakness had led him to where he was now, and he realized that plainly. The truth was that simple. Matheson was weak and had to die, and during the torturous worm eating towards his skull, it happened. He didn't even cry out, saying he was a noble. He said nothing about his father or any nobility. He didn't even bargain. He simply fought defiantly, relying on himself to the bitter end. Matheson was finally, figuratively, dead, comma, reborn again. He was now nameless and ready to start life anew. It was necessary. Matheson was too weak. And in this painful stupor, the worm finally disabled his body and gave him some relief, comma, under the command of Sylvia, of course. I'll give you control of your body after I do some tests. Sylvia smiled and got to work, funneling some more varieties parasites into his body. Diagnostic bugs. Matheson ignored her. He couldn't feel anything, but neither did he care. As long as he was paralyzed, he was now even a prisoner in his own body. However, the lack of sensation let him feel something else. Something familiar, but new. It was power in its raw form. It was gentle. It was mana. Chapter 211. Sylvia had finished with her tests. She gave Matheson back some bodily control. Not all of it, but some. Matheson had sensed mana by himself for the first time. Despite all the pain and mental trauma, he couldn't help but grin madly, his eyes still bloodshot. Why are you smiling? Sylvia asked, seeming genuinely concerned this time. Matheson only leant his head back and smiled, holding onto the feeling of mana sense and imprinting it in his mind. Okay, smiley. I'll be back later. Matheson ignored her as she left, but couldn't help but repeat what she said. Smiley. He grinned madly, smiley. Some part of him, deep in his heart was filled with joy. It was his new name. Smiley sat there, accepting his new name, and continued to focus on the mana, remembering the teachings that Villada ruthlessly hammered into him. Your skeleton has died. Your skeleton has died. What the fuck? Jay stopped meditating. The died so quickly that he couldn't use the host skill. A little under two hours had passed since he sent his skeletons, Sweeper and Lamp, off to slay the beast chasing them. Thankfully, his mana was high again thanks to his meditating, but some tension was starting to build in his chest. So it has killed Sweeper three times and Lamp once. I think it's time I send some extra skeletons. He nodded with a dutiful look. He was no longer nonchalant about the situation, and was taking it much more seriously now. First, he summoned Sweeper and Lamp again, equipping them with the last spear and an Osain sword. Blue rushed out of the desert responding to an order, and dropping the lizard head on the sand before meeting its master. Handy was still alone in the desert plucking the red fruit, but it was almost to the other side now, so there wasn't as much of a need to be on fruit clipping duty. Jay looked around at his skeletons with him. Blue, red, lamp, sweeper, dark, heavy. Jay wanted to keep dark and heavy practicing, and since dark and heavy could be trusted, he decided to send red along with blue for extra backup. Compared to last time, the party of undead was more than double the strength as blue and red were one level higher than lamp and sweeper. Jay also planned to use the host skill to analyze the beast, 
hopefully learning its level and even weakness, before it gets to him, and with four skeletons, he would be able to use the host skill, before all of them died at least. One spearman and three swordsmen good. Blue, you're in charge of slaying that beast. Jay pointed with an officer's authority towards the direction of the enemy, and the skeletons all sprinted off once more. Hopefully once more. His leisurely attitude was gone. He turned to dark and heavy. You two, start sparring with each other. He said, a hint of anger in his voice. The skeletons each nodded, and soon the clanging of weapons and the shield started sounding out on the edge of the rocky mountain. While the encroaching beast was an ever-pressing matter, the sparring skeletons began to compete with it for Jay's attention. Besides, it would still be almost an hour before he would receive any notifications, based on the time it took Sweeper to die last time, so it was okay to watch. Clang exclamation point tilde. Duck parried a slash, and using the momentum returned a thrust with its second blade. The blade dug into the shield and left a small imprint. Heavy was the smaller skeleton, but its weighty armor stopped it from moving back as it braced itself. Duck jumped back and analyzed its prey as it thought for a moment. It wasn't happy merely doing damage to the shield, so it was forced to come up with a different strategy. Heavy gazed at Duck from behind its shield, slowly inching forward like a moving wall, comma albeit a very small wall as it was short. Finally, Duck moved again. Duck assumed a battle stance as it crouched low, spinning one knife into a reverse grip, and then dashing back into the fight. Heavy stepped forward with a slash comma however it was a feint. It put zero strength into the slash. Duck easily deflected the weak strike, but didn't expect the shield to move so quickly. B-O-O-N-G Tilda. Heavy redirected its strength into the shield. With a small thud, Heavy bashed its shield against Dark, using the momentum of both of them to create a bigger impact. It was the lower level skeleton, so it had to use its opponent's weight against it. Jay nodded in approval as he watched closely. Dark was thrown off balance for a moment. It had never experienced such a feeling before. But now, another thrust was coming directly towards it, comma this time. It was easy to tell that it had as much strength in it as Heavy could muster. Dark frantically slashed both of its dual daggers upwards at once. Even to its own surprise, this was enough to deflect the powerful strike, sending it grazing right past its shoulder. Dark jumped back once more, reanalyzing the fight, after it nearly took massive damage delivered straight to its spine. While it had dual daggers on its side, there was no getting past the shield. Despite being the level 2 skeleton, it was tactically outmatched. Plus, its mind was technically younger. Hum, what will Dark do? Jay believed the fight was pretty one-sided, especially since Heavy had full set of heavy armor and a shield on its side, while Dark only had the two daggers to keep it light and nimble. Counter to Jay's expectations, Dark jumped back further and turned to the side as it began running through the rocks, weaving in and out of them with tremendous speed. Its light body allowed it to turn at sharp angles without losing any speed. Heavy had to keep spinning and repositioning its shield, but suddenly a dagger fell down from the sky behind it. The dagger was obviously a misdirection, and Heavy was only distracted for a fraction of a second. But this was all the assassin needed. It quickly sprinted from a concealed crack behind some rocks, dashing with undead speed, and pouncing with its last dagger out. Heavy raised the shield but couldn't brace in time. Dark bashed its body against the shield, ignoring the damage as it raised its arm to block a sword slash, taking enough damage to snap its arm. With the shield pushed up against its body, Heavy was vulnerable. The dagger Dark had saved was thrust into its eyes. Time seemed to show as the dagger shimmered with a bone luster towards its face. Heavy tried to lower its head so the helmet would take the hit, but it was simply too late. D-O-N-K tilde. The dagger pierced its eye socket, but stopped just before it hit the back of the skull. Duck didn't want to hurt Heavy in any meaningful way. Heavy stopped moving as it stood there with Duck's blade in its face, comma not because it was dead, but because it was realizing what just happened. It lost. Duck wasn't sure what to do now either. It had won the fight but lost an arm, so it didn't go to pick up its new dagger. They were both caught in a strange embrace, as neither knew the ethics around beating an opponent. However, both of them soon heard a sound. Looking around, they heard a slow clapping sound, and saw a smiling human face. Excellent fight. Jay smiled, now we will do it again, but this time it will be a little different. The skeletons finally disengaged, 
Dark pulled its dagger out of Heavy's eye and stared at Jay for a moment, both wondering what was going to happen. Chapter 212. You two will fight again. But now, Dark will be one-handed. Jay said as he picked up Dark's drop dagger. The skeletons each looked at Jay dumbfounded. Their master wanted them to fight again. Of course, Jay expected Heavy to win now. And this strategy would also allow Dark to think more tactically and gain more battle experience. After another short battle, Heavy did win, though it lost its shield. Jay could craft another as he had the blueprint down in his mind. Dark won the next round, then the next round, until Heavy used its second arm to start grappling, and won again. Soon enough, Heavy lost its arm too, and then Dark continued to win for the next few rounds. The skeletons didn't kill each other during the fighting, but would stop just before killing each other, and would mostly only use tactics to disable. However, if any human or animal ever took a dagger to the eye socket, they would perish without enough health, suffering a major critical hit. Soon, Jay gave them some respite and healed them, restoring their weapons and crafting a new shield for Heavy. The skeletons, despite being level 2 and 1, were each quickly turning into experienced fighters. Someday they would be masters of war, able to sway the ebb and flow of any battlefield. But for now they were nothing but novices. Novices who could happily amputate each other and keep fighting to the death. A threat was still approaching however, and Jay didn't think he would need to conserve his mana before the beast would reach them, as he believed it would die this time. That was until he got some notifications. Your skeleton has died. Your skeleton has died. Fuck train normally again. Jay had a bitter expression on his face. Two skeletons perished almost instantly. Quickly, he sat down and activated the host skill on blue, and was transported into the body of his minion. Your skeleton has died. What the fuck? His jaws clinked. Sweeper stabbed the bear and jumped back from a claw or attack, but the beast pounced forward with a second slash, ending Sweeper with a single strike of its strange thorn-like claws. The spears did absolutely nothing to stop it. The beast shrugged off the hit without even flinching. Jay got a glance at the beast before it came charging. Its form was like a bear covered in thorns and thistles, a twisted piece of nature and beast made up of sickly grey vines and thorns. The vines seemed to wriggle and twist around its body endlessly, and despite having shade vision, Jay couldn't tell if there was any fur or flesh underneath. Unfortunately, he didn't analyze it. The beast was already charging, and he didn't want to experience second-hand death again. So he quickly ended the host skill. Your skeletons has died. Jay exhaled with a heavy breath, only just escaping the feeling of death right before the beast came crashing down on his hosted skeleton. Damn it. What the fuck was that thing? For a brief moment, Heavy and Dark looked up at him but soon went back to slashing their swords in the air as they trained themselves, minding their own business. Jay added more bones to his pile, and began his summoning ritual. In no time, all his skeletons were summoned once again, and it wasn't long before they were equipped to try to at least do some damage this time. He shook his head disappointed in his skeleton as they ran off once more. Jay had not been paying enough attention to the time. But it was clear the beast was getting closer, as the skeletons were dying more frequently. For the beast though, it would simply be encountering skeletons more regularly as it drew closer to Jay, probably thinking it was getting deeper into enemy territory where there were more patrols. Jay went back to meditating, recovering his mana while the skeletons ran back into battle. The meditation didn't last very long, and not even 30 minutes passed before he started receiving the death notifications once more. Unfortunately, he responded a little too slowly as he was meditating, and before he could come to his senses, they were all dead again. Shit 30 minutes away. Before he began summoning again, Jay checked the desert progress. It seemed that Handy was almost done with clearing a path across the mushroom field. In the back of Jay's head, he knew his options were to either keep running along the desert trapped between the cliffs and the mushroom desert until nightfall, slay the beast or cross the mushroom field now, while he had a path open, and hopefully it wouldn't follow. With a worried look, Jay summoned them all again and remade their weapons. He was getting annoyed that they were dying to one single enemy so quickly, and he didn't care for excuses. But the skeletons didn't make any either, they simply carried out their task without any hesitation. Jay pointed his finger with a quick angry gesture towards where the beast was coming from. The skeletons dashed off once more, but Blue lingered for a moment, glancing at Heavy and Dark. 
Blue seemed to be interested in the skeleton's strange behavior, almost sensing that they were different. But after a moment Blue dashed away and followed the other skeletons. You'll get a mind soon too. Blue, just as soon as we're safe, Jay nodded. Why is Blue curious anyway, hum? Perhaps getting a mind is a natural progress kind of thing. Or perhaps it's just my own subconscious, interested in my own skeletons. Jay scratched his chin, wondering for a moment before making some preparations. Instead of meditating this time, Jay began to craft more weapons instead. He made the usual sets of weapons for the skeletons, in this case, Arsane swords for sweeper, lamp blue and red, and then crafted another set of six daggers, along with six spears. All of the products were level 3, except for the spears which Jay needed more practice with. Though he was quite happy to see that his swords were now level 3, even though he didn't use any silt wolf bones. As Jay crafted, he wondered if he would be able to give his weapons abilities. Or if it was a random chance that they would get them. Perhaps it was a matter of design, like with the shields. He remembered the impressive cloud spear that the guard Paul wielded and considered his own shield was a unique one with abilities. Technically his swords did have abilities, such as their lifespan ability, but those were just passives on all his undead weapons. Jay wanted to simply sit down and spend a day, or even a few weeks, simply crafting weapons or working on his spells and research, but between leveling up and experimenting when he first started, or his current predicament of being on the run, there was simply no time to do anything. Plus, he now had to give the skeletons minds, and then have them retrain with each other. With his to-do list growing he was feeling mentally fatigued, and in this pressing situation of the beast now closer than ever, the signs of stress were beginning to show. Your skeleton has died. Chapter 213. Fuck. Barely 10 minutes had passed when another skeleton had perished, slain by the beast. Jay quickly sat near a rock and used his host skill to try and get a closer look at the encroaching monster. Concentrating on blue, his mind went to darkness again, before entering the black and white world behind the skeleton's eyes. Two skeletons were still alive, red and lamp stood at either side of the beast, and slashed at the tentacles covering its whole body. Tentacles. Hum, actually they seemed to be more like vines, Jay thought. The shape of the beast's body was like a bear, though its shoulders were much more narrow and each of its front legs sat under its chest instead of at the sides, so while having the size of a bear it was quite slender. Perfect for running through the forest and weaving between trees. The whole creature was covered thickly with these ash grey vines, and Jay would have thought that it was composed entirely of vines, if not for the large snout poking out, complete with a set of muscular jaws lined with dagger-like teeth. Its saber-like claws came falling down, threatening to smash Red to pieces. But Red dodged back just in time, as the claws descended before it. Then with a lunge, it pierced the vines, and lightly stabbed the flesh hiding underneath. Pulling out its blade though, it seemed that it didn't sink very deep as only the very tip had any blood on it. Lamp similarly attacked, but slashed at the vines instead. The blade came cleaving sideways, but as it hit the vines, it harmlessly rattled off, as if it was trying to cut through steel with a pathetic slash. Not so much as a small indentation was left on the vines. Peculiarly, the bear responded to Lamp first, immediately spinning left and snapping its jaws. Protecting the vines, Jay thought. Another claw attack came flying horizontally, threatening to cut down anything that dared to stand before it. Instead of dodging backwards, Lamp dodged further to the side, trying to stay near the creature's side. With the creature spun around, Red was right at its back, and a prime opportunity to attack presented itself. But would it take it? Do it Jay thought mercilessly. This attack would be quite shameful to do, not only to carry out, but to even mention. It would be one of the dark secrets Jay would keep with him till the grave and beyond. For a creature such as this, there was one spot on its anatomy which had no armor or natural defenses. Jay made sure there was no one around before this vile attack was made. Red stepped forward with a powerful thrust, sending the sword deeply into the creature's body. A critical hit, but at what cost? A little shame. Since the swords had no hand guard or cross guard, they were simply just skewers with a sharp edge, and combined with the skeleton's slender arm, it would easily pierce any openings. The skeleton added so much force to this faithful attack, that not only did the sword enter the creature, but its hand did too, going all the way up to its wrist. The bear immediately responded with a fearsome roar to such a dangerous provocation, 
Jay couldn't see its eyes, but he could tell they widened in shock as it clenched its jaws and tried to spin around to fight back. Jay felt a sense of shame, but it was his only option. If the beast caught him, it would definitely torture him, and he would accept such a punishment for this inhuman violation. Attacking its sacred vines was one thing, but this was something which made it ignore the vines altogether. As it spun around, Red did too. It was still gripping the blade and cutting open the insides of the creature from behind, though it was basically stuck. The bear continued to spin though, and eventually Red's body collided with Lamp. It was like the bear was chasing its own tail, if its tail was an undead skeleton anyway. Jay would have laughed, but it simply looked too painful, and he was grimacing instead. The frightening feeling he got from powerful forest creatures' presence was reduced to pity. The bear finally realized what it needed to do. Speeding to a nearby rock, it smashed Red's body into it at warp speed. The skeleton collapsed in a clinking of broken bones and dust which flew everywhere. Lamp was attacking all this time, but would soon be slain as well. All this time, the skeletons were only dodging its strikes, as they learned that a single hit would end them, or at least take them out of the fight. With not much time left, Jay finally analyzed the bear. Blood Vine Bear, level 27. Type, Beast, Blood, Stalker. HP, 1631-1742. Damage, 50, Claws, Bite, Slash, Crush. 25, Blood Drinking Vines. Bleed, 3 seconds, 5 stacks. Skills, Blood Rejuvenation. No hunger, no thirst as long as the vines are fed. 84% health regen. Requires blood otherwise all stats are halved. Vine prison. Numerous twisting and spindling vines enclose an enemy. Bleeds due to blood drinking vines. Immobilizes. Blood scent passive. 3, 200 meter range. Targets cannot hide. Target does not need to be bleeding. But it helps. Restless hunger passive. The vines don't allow the bear to sleep, but repay it with immortality so long as they are fed. Provides temporary immortality. Description. No one can ever tell where the vines end and the bear starts. Commonly called the kings of the jungle, these beasts carve out large plots of thick forests for themselves, their hunting grounds. A necessity as their vines need a constant supply of fresh blood. Damn it, no wonder they were having so much trouble Jay thought, so it's smelling my blood. I'm in its territory. Right as he analyzed it, the bear suddenly used one of its skills. The vines folded away from the bear's body, and swallowed lamp as if it was in a coffin. The bleed effect of the vines did nothing to the skeleton, but the vines themselves were powerful enough to crush its bones into dust. Jay quickly ended the host skill, conserving his mana. It would only be a few moments until Blue died, and probably not much longer until the beast caught up with Jay after he summoned them all again. Jay glanced at the desert. Handy was finally finished and the way was mostly clear. There were a few areas where Jay would have to weave between the mushrooms. But there was a path across at least. It was his escape path. After Jay summoned the skeletons, he hid behind a boulder and gazed across the rocks. After they were summoned he could finally see it coming. The blood vine bear was covering ground at a high speed. Slower than the skeletons but still fast. It looked much more fierce in color. It seemed that as it got closer to Jay it even sped up. Smelling the scent of his blood in the air as it became more ravenous. Its meal was close. Its vines needed watering. Jay began his escape plan. He quickly had dark and heavy dash across the desert in case there was anything there to attack him on the other side. They still needed some training. But it was better than nothing. Don't touch the mushrooms he added, just in case the young-minded skeletons had not learnt about the dangerous fruits. After all, their minds were formed after Jay discovered the carnivorous side of the seemingly placid mushrooms. They had not witnessed the glade deer being torn apart. Jay handed the other skeletons their weapons once last time as the beast approached. Gathering his bone pile, the extra daggers and spears he created, he was ready to leave. The blood vine bear was closing in and once more it clashed with the skeletons, but finally it spotted its meal, and for a moment, ignored the undead horrors around it as it stared at him. While it could have simply ignored the skeletons and charged right after Jay, it decided to finish the off first, not willing to experience what it did the previous time when its back was turned. Somehow it knew this was the being which caused it pain, and an angry roar sounded, shifting rocks and sand as it stared into Jay's eyes, the source of the skeletons. 
Chapter 214 The mountains echoed as the beast roared when it saw its meal, trying to scare Jay into submission. The beast still had over 1000 health, and Jay definitely didn't have the damage to stop it. Neither did he have the mana to sustain his skeletons, especially when each of them were dying in 1-2 to two hits. Jay had no doubts that his fate would be the same as Lance, encased helplessly in vines as they drained all his blood, before twisting the remains of his body into a paste, wringing out every drop of the blood, as if he were a damp cloth. Fighting a level 27 beast was just too far beyond his skill level. Perhaps if it didn't know exactly where he was and had no health regeneration, there would be a way to hide somewhere and send his skeletons in over a few days, whittling it down slowly. But right now the only option was to flee. There was no escaping its blood scent. Jay could only hope that the beast wouldn't follow him across the desert, which would at the very least give him more time. Perhaps in the forest he would be able to find a dungeon and take refuge inside one. But even then, the beast would still be somewhere outside, lurking for prey and waiting. With the 3000 meter range of its blood scent ability, there was also not much chance of escaping its moors. Jay could only hope that once he crossed the desert, there would be another glade deer which the beast would chase instead. Sure, it would have to travel around the desert again, but that would only prolong the inevitable as it resumed the hunt. What mattered right now though was what was in front of him. The beast, which was already decimating his skeletons. With no other options, Jay dashed from behind the boulder and ran straight towards the mushroom desert. The beast almost seemed to be shocked as its second meal was about to run into the embrace of the carnivorous mushrooms again. It released another frustrated roar, shaking pebbles and shifting the grains of sand. But this time it had undertones of sadness and alarm. Ironically, it was like it was trying to warn Jay just so that it would be the one to kill him. Jay ignored it completely. Its fearful roar still had no effect on him whatsoever. Getting to the edge of the desert he didn't hesitate as he jumped right onto the sand, and began weaving between the hazardous mushrooms. Each step was concise and purposeful as he navigated around the field. Suddenly an intense burning pain came from Jay's arm. Looking down though, there was no mushroom clinging to it. He didn't have time to worry about it though. The beast was gazing at him coldly, ignoring the skeletons for a moment as it shrugged off the hits. It waited to watch Jay die. Its eyes squinted for a moment as it gazed, and finally it saw something which reignited a fire in its belly. A skeleton was on the other side of the field. Two skeletons were in front of Jay, also crossing the field. The beast wasn't mindless, and after living for so many decades, its intelligence grew along with its strength. It was its intelligence that stopped it charging recklessly into the mushrooms in the first place. But right now it was only thinking one thing. There was a way across. The prey was not dead. The hunt was not over. Finally it would steal a meal back from the damn mushrooms. As Jay dashed across the field, there was a change in the sand instead of shifting constantly by all the wriggling and squirming lizards underneath, it suddenly stopped. But only for a moment. Suddenly, the small waves of sand were moving in one direction, towards Jay. Oh fuck, oh shit, what are they doing? He thought, dodging another mushroom. So many variables and thoughts were running through Jay's mind at once. Where would he run to next after crossing the desert? Will the beast follow him across? How would he outrun it now? The only chance of living would be to miraculously find a dungeon on the other side, somewhere in the forest. Since when did he have such profound luck? Why were the lizards suddenly all coming towards him? Oh, stop. Dodge that hanging fruit. Why is my arm burning with a hot itchiness? Your skeleton has been slain. Now the death notifications were annoying him in the already stressful situation. If Jay could put his current situation into words, he would only have three. I am fucked. The gaps between the mushrooms got skinnier to run through, and he wasn't even halfway across. Though he came to the area where the skeletons started cutting away the red fruits, this only made it harder as now he had to push past the hanging tendrils, and if the skeletons missed even one fruit, Jay would only be able to escape via amputation. For a moment, he wondered if his situation could get any worse. As if responding to his thoughts, a new threat emerged from the sand, the damn lizards. Each of them were no real threat to Jay. However, they had one ability which set them apart from all other little critters. They could utilize the fruit. A little lizard head popped out of the sand with a red fruit on its mouth, right near Jay's foot. Fuck. He flinched only missing it slightly. 
He quickly pulled his foot up right before the lizard started waving its head around trying to attach the fruit to his body. One red fruit would not do too much to slow him down, but ten, one hundred, if they were stuck to his body, he would progressively get slower, allowing more fruit to stick to him, and soon enough it would be a death sentence. A painfully slow one, remembering the lizards eating their own kind to consume the fruit, Jay's blood started pumping, and his adrenaline started coursing through his veins, his heartbeat accelerating and seeming to make time slow, as his thoughts became clearer, almost calm, as his current objectives to survive were simple. Dodge the red fruit, don't slow down. All his other thoughts were pushed to the back of his mind. Jay checked the bottom of the mushroom tendrils, pushing them aside like curtains before dashing through. Thankfully the skeletons carved a straight path through the mushroom field. The beast had finally killed the skeletons, and was already running towards where Jay entered the desert. Chapter 215 The vine beast reached the edge of the desert as it followed its lunch. Jay made it to the middle of the desert right as the beast entered. He had to do something to slow the beast down, but the damn lizards were almost right underneath him, each having a fruit in their mouths ready to stick to Jay's flesh. He had to either keep moving or die. A few of the underground lizards haphazardly poked their heads up right below a mushroom fruit, and became victims themselves, releasing little cooing noises, as they were slowly pulled into the air, becoming food for the mushrooms, which disappeared shortly after. When a mushroom disappeared it made some extra space, and even allowed the beast to run faster. The mushrooms at the center of the desert were larger, taller, and one was right in the middle of Jay's path. So the skeletons mostly trimmed every single one underneath. Jay quickly took shelter under it, and thinking fast, he summoned a bone pile around the trunk of the mushroom, and stood on top of it, using the trunk for his own support. With the bones below him, the lizards wouldn't be able to reach him now. Next, he tossed the spears in the sand and summoned the skeletons again. He cast the summoning spell four times before the first skeleton was even summoned, and a large volume of the glowing necrotic mana surrounded a portion of the bone pile, which began to assemble four skeletons at the same time, as many bones floated around and were distributed to where they were needed. Looking back, the vine bear was already making its way through the mushrooms, navigating them with deadly precision. Contrary to Jay's expectations, the beast easily dodged through the mushrooms, as its body was now, somehow, more long and slender. The vines, which had been coiled around its body, were now piled up on its back, and even seemed to squeeze its ribs, making its body even more slender, allowing it to weave between the dangerous mushrooms as nimbly as Jay did. Seeing more of its body now, Jay was surprised at how slender it truly was. Its bones were protruding from its flesh, and its flesh was loosely clinging to its bones. Essentially, it looked like it was starving. Jay received a notification but ignored it as he caught his breath for a moment. But before the skeletons even formed he was running again, pushing through the curtains of hanging tendrils. He kept running, and as soon as his foot touched the sand again, the lizards were already swarming around him like a school of hungry piranhas. As each of the skeletons formed, Jay commanded them to grab the spears and form a spear wall. One spear was not very hazardous to the bear, but a small wall of them with the dangerous mushrooms at their side was another matter. What form was essentially a blockade, and the beast would have to charge right into them. This was Jay's only hope to slow the beast down, as his mana dwindled to dangerously low levels, comma, his body was coursing with adrenaline though. But right now it was barely keeping his mind focused. Since Jay momentarily stopped on the bone pile, most of the had caught up now that Jay had stopped, and he was like a magnet. The only good thing about this situation was that some of the lizards had wasted some fruit, attaching them to the bottom of the bone pile Jay was standing on, comma, but the middle of the desert was brimming with these fruit, and they only had to search for a second, before plucking another one to chase Jay with. Handy, Heavy and Dark had made it to the other side by now. Heavy and Dark guarded the exit of the mushroom path with Handy was running through the trees somewhere deeper in the jungle, scouring it for enemies, and looking for hidden threats. Thankfully, after scouting for some time, Handy was still alive. There were no threats in the forest. It seemed that the blood vine bear had feasted on every living thing in its territory. Not even birds escaped the insatiable appetite of its blood vines. Jay sprinted frantically across the sand, dodging mushroom fruit sometimes only by a hair, while the lizards followed closely behind with their exploding red fruits, ready to trap Jay. 
if he ever dared to slow down. The lizards were just as fast underground as Jay was above ground, and only had to stop when they poked their head above the surface to trap him. Jay was making good speed across the desert, and was nearly across. Despite the dangers, Jay smiled a little when he heard something behind him. It almost sounded like a hissing noise as the spears dug into the sand. The beast crashed into the spear wall. It took 200% extra damage from every spear, but it already had so much health that it was an acceptable trade-off to catch its prey, Komabo perhaps even to its own surprise. It was stopped by four measly spears. The four spears were enough to stop it, as each of them had the anti-charge ability to stop 50 kilograms, 110 pounds, and with four of the spears combined, they had enough stopping power to halt 200 kilograms, comma enough to stop the starved beast. Jay expected it to weigh more, but it seemed that the bear was severely malnourished. It was no wonder it was hunting with with such endless resoluteness. It was right after winter too, so perhaps it burned through all its fat comma or blood storage comma while food was scarce. It's really no wonder the vines were grey instead of a blood red. The blood vine bear was forced to smash away the spears with a flick of its claws, but as it knocked two away, another two would take its place. With a roar it summoned its vine again. The spears didn't have a chance against the shifting vines, and soon enough another skeleton was entombed in them and crushed to pieces. The other spears prodded it, stinging its flesh as if they were little more than ants. But it seemed that only one skeleton had to fall, before the others would follow shortly after. A single breach in the spear wall was enough to break it, and the skeletons began dodging backwards to hold its attention. It was the only way they could go. Jay, however, was already out of the desert, comma, the pursuing lizards, all stopped at the edge. A few still hopelessly waved their heads around, as they followed the smell of the human, comma, but it was no use. He had escaped. Escaped the lizards and the desert anyway. The beast was still traveling across, and Jay was out of mana and pretty low energy too. There was nowhere to run. Jay let out some frustration on the lizards. I should have killed you little fuckers when I had the chance he said, spitting right onto the heads of one of the lizards. Jay smiled slyly, satisfied that he hit one. There was something satisfying to him about spitting in the faces of his enemies. Suddenly, the lizards began moving again. They seemed to be smelling something else. Something with a stronger scent comma the blood vine bear. The lizards had let one meal escape, but now there was another one, and coincidentally they were right in front of it, comma, it was even heading right towards them. The blood vine bear, while observant, did not notice the lizards that were attacking Jay from below. It was more preoccupied with dodging between the mushrooms, and the delicious scent of blood coming from Jay. Little did it know, it was now the one being hunted. Small waves of sand covertly swarmed towards the blood vine bear. Chapter 216 For a moment, Jay was distracted as he thought it quite odd. He had hunted the lizards, the lizards hunted the bear, and the bear hunted him. Almost like a circle of life. Or death. He shrugged. Jay planned to run as soon as he reached the other side. Comma, he didn't expect the bear to follow him across the mushroom path. Furthermore, he also didn't expect the lizards to try and kill him either. For this reason, he waited for a moment, curious to see what would happen. The underground lizards was all swimming towards the unsuspecting blood beast. But he couldn't help but wonder one thing. Why didn't they attack the skeletons? Of course, the lizards relied on their sense of smell. But the skeletons Jay had were ancient, pulled from a mass grave of Holvetians. The only smell coming from them was death and decay. A putrid rot. Suddenly, the skeletons holding off the bear were given some respite as the bear stopped attacking for a single moment. It felt some fruit on its flesh, comma, it knew it had to cut it off or a tendril would pull it apart. It lifted its paw and gazed as a growth of red fungus that became as hard as stone. To the bear's surprise, there was no tendril attached to the fruit. Suddenly, another one attached to one of its other feet, and below its body more red fruit appeared in the jaws of lizards, all poking up to try and attach one to it. The beast didn't even roar, there was no time to be angry. It knew it had to move. It charged forward again, the last spear crumbled and snapped as it pierced the bear's skin, though it ignored the remaining skeletons which were nearly dead anyway. Jay remained and watched on, and soon his hopelessness disappeared as it was replaced with an excited joy. I guess it's not a circle of death. It ends with me. He smiled. This was his chance at survival, and he was going to make the most of it. 
Seeing that the bear was now alarmed, Jay made the remaining skeletons jump and hold onto it to try and slow it even more. Jay quickly created another bone pile and summoned two skeletons which had just died. The last of his mana left his body and his mind was now feeling slow and numb. Thankfully, he had two more spears left which he had previously crafted. If only for a moment they would slow it down, but that would be all the time that the underground lizards would need. The mushrooms attached to the bear's paws already slowed it down enough so that every now and then a few lizards could attach another fruit, which only slowed it down more. The process would be a snowball effect. Jay's skeletons rushed back into the field. The beast had crossed the halfway point but was slowing down. In a few moments it already had more fruit attached to its legs. Some unfortunate lizards also joined the mass of fruit attached to its legs, comma though they were quickly pulverized into bloody messes. Jay could tell the beast's energy was dwindling. It had been fighting skeletons and pursuing him all this way. Plus, it had already lost a deer after a long chase too. Now that the vines were on its back, he could see every one of its muscles straining and being pushed to their limits, almost snapping with each step the beast would take. It was like it was walking through thick mud, or even a tar pit. It wouldn't last long. Nevertheless, it maintained a reasonable speed. Even with a skeleton clinging to its body, and the large growing balls of hardened red fruit on each of its legs, it was slower than before but was still quite fast, all things considered. At least until it made it to the fresh spear-wielding skeletons. It was stopped again, not even having the strength to push past two spears now. The lizards were still working diligently, and even more quickly, as they sensed it slowing down. Jay smiled for a moment, thinking he had won, but his smile was shortly wiped away. Suddenly, the vines moved again, seeming to get smaller as they moved around the bear's body. What the fuck? Jay couldn't believe his eyes. The vines suddenly pierced the bear's skin and coiled around its legs. They quickly gave it a boost of strength to get through the small roadblock. Damn it. If it got past the skeletons, there would be nothing he could do. His mana dwindled so low that it may as well be zero, and the beast would slay him without restraint. Both of them had low energy too, so Jay wouldn't be able to run far. Comma though the beast would still be able to travel further than he could, without his skeleton cohort carrying him along. I didn't want to have to use these Jay thought, pulling out an acid-filled crystal from his inventory, but it seems I have no choice. The crystal looked as harmless as a jewel resting in his hand, but inside was acid, which could melt through giant stone statues and pyramids floors alike. The vines reinforced the beast's muscles, and allowed it to push past the spears, and crack them in half. Again, it ignored the two skeletons, Red and Sweeper, and it went to dash past quickly. Meanwhile, Jay looked at the skeleton clinging to its flesh, and suddenly he had a better idea. Jay directly sent a bunch of thought commands to Red, the stress in each thought making the skeleton respond instantly. Red grabbed a snapped piece of bone spear. Standing near a mushroom tendril, it found one with a fruit still attached. A simple flick was all it took. Can't believe I didn't do this sooner Jay shook his head. Red used the broken spear to push the red fruit towards the bear, and it exploded onto the vines. It wouldn't have worked if the bear was still as fast as its original speed, but now each of its paws was covered in a bulky mass of the red fruits, sand, and some dead lizards scattered throughout. The bear only noticed after it pulled against the tendril. To Jay's surprise, the tendrils were stronger than they looked, and refused to give way. The bear turned its head. With a pained roar it shook its body, and the vines moved again. Some of the vines were ripped off, a necessary sacrifice to keep its life. However, this pause allowed even more fruit to attach to its paws and legs, while the dastardly skeleton flung another tendril attached fruit towards it. This time, it stuck right onto its fur, exploding and growing into a large red plaster, and seeping deep into its skin. Jay smiled like a fiend as he watched. His plans were coming to fruition, literally. The beast still clung to hope as it tried to pull away, straining its fur against the fruit, and attempted to rip itself away, enduring the pain. Then, another fruit came flying, attaching to the vines again. Then another to its fur. Then another, and another, and another. Red just wouldn't fucking stop, no matter how much the bear roared. Jay was almost beginning to feel sorry for it, comma, with all these attached mushrooms. It was about to be ripped apart in many different directions. Unless it could get free. Bombarded by fruit from above and below. 
The beast could do nothing now but collapse from exhaustion and hunger. Still, its eyes were fixated on Jay. Anger, hate, hunger, bitterness, revenge. Then after a few moments, gratitude, rest, congratulation. Its eyes seemed to say everything that a rock couldn't. A feeling of sorrow mixed in with Jay's excitement to kill a comma he was unknowingly about to snuff out another immortal life, a mind much older than a human's would ever be. While it was only level 27, it had reached these heights hunting in the outside world. Its prey was nothing but the low-level forest fauna, and the old monster which it slayed mercilessly, neither of which would give abundant experience. The vines also sapped its strength until it was used to feed again. In one sense, it was like a slave to the vines. The mushrooms responded to the pulling on their tendrils, and they began to retract. Red was continuing its orders with blind diligence, adding more and more mushrooms to the monster's flesh. The mushroom field seemed to be stronger than the beast. Each of its caps pulled the beast without even bending. Jay had tried to analyze them, but to no avail. The beast continued to gaze at Jay as it was soon dragged across the sand. Chapter 217 the blood vine bear had been caught in the mushrooms. Just like the glade deer, its body was soon suspended in the air, its legs hanging with large balls of red fruit and dead lizards weaved into the mess. Unlike the glade deer, the bear was now attached to many mushroom tendrils, more than what was possible for alone animals. Red was diligent if nothing else. Its fur was pulled tight, and the vines were still trying to fight back as they sunk into the beast's skin. But it was for nothing. The bear had already given its all. It seemed that the red fruit even penetrated the flesh. And went down to mixing with bone. As it grew into every crack. As not only flesh was pulled away. The body of the bear was like a rag doll as it was pulled tight. Pieces of flesh were ripped out by the mushroom tendrils in some places. While others caused its bone to dislocate. And soon enough it ripped away limbs. Life left the bear's eyes. But not a single drop of blood fell from its wounds. The vines became red once more, they retracted from the bear, draining the last of its blood. Jay ignored any notifications he received as he watched quietly. The bear died, and soon the vines would follow. Below it though, hundreds of lizards were holding red fruits in the air, and the vine had no eyes of its own, so it didn't event realize its current predicament. Jay didn't really mind the gore, as he was previously a butcher anyway. He was used to it. Besides, all the things he saw as an adventurer built up his tolerance. Each piece of the bear separated and pulled under a different mushroom cap, along with ripped off pieces of the blood vines. The mushrooms closed, and one of them even seemed like an overstuffed snake, as it took the bulk of the bear's body, and dipped back below the sand. A large patch of the desert was finally free of mushrooms, as they hid under the sand, and began to process their meals. Jay was glad that the lizards at least didn't get a meal either. It seemed that both of these enemies hunted by scent, but it was their own reliance on the smells which were their undoing. After a moment of silence, all the lizards went back to gathering fruit, and the desert was quiet once more, as if nothing ever happened. All the tracks were covered up by the shifting sands. The only thing remaining was a peculiar pile of bones under a large mushroom in the middle of the desert comma and red, who quickly rejoined its master's side. Jay simply stood there watching. Suddenly all his plans of running for a dungeon and hiding were pointless, without the predator chasing him. He was safe again. Safe for now anyway. Of course, he wouldn't be able to run back across the desert. That way was blocked by lizards. He turned to the dark forest behind him. It was quiet, damp, the air thick and humid. A wall of forest began where the desert ended. Jay looked up at the jagged snow-capped mountain one last time, resolute and silent. With a sigh, he stepped into the veil of trees, disappearing into the green barrage of flora. As if he had never been there at all. Tilda somewhere north of Jay, end of the mountain R-E-N-G-E -E, Tilda. In the last five hours, north of Jay. A mage hunter had made some discoveries. Number 3. I found another human skeleton. Long since dead with one arm. Ancient skeleton. No anomalies. A moment passed. But an uncaring voice sounded back through his communication crystal. Proceed. So far nothing much was too far out of the ordinary comma. This was his second human skeleton. But it was still reasonably within the hunting range of Losler. And even within reasonable expectations. Besides, one of the other mage hunters found a human skeleton too, while another found a cave with numerous carcasses stuck to the walls, covered with some sort of blue slime, so it wasn't like finding a second human skeleton was a rare oddity. 
Besides, the bones were ancient. Since Jay was 18, it didn't make sense for him to have such old skeletons. Unfortunately, the skeletons they caught at Losler hadn't been thoroughly analyzed yet, and no one really seemed to notice these finer details. The mage hunter trudged onwards, diligently carrying out his duty as he remained alert. Some time later, however, he made another discovery, comma, one that he was sure would gain attention, and hopefully one that would bring him some reinforcement. Number 3 Reporting I found another skeleton with a bone-based weapon. A bone spear, broken into pieces. Both ancient skeletons. Hold. A voice quickly responded. Then a moment later, number 2 and 4 are en route. Proceed quickly. Find Jay no matter what. The voice sounded with both a mix of fanaticism and threat. Perhaps even excitement. The threat in the voice, however, was towards number 3 pushing him to exert his full potential in the hunt, and warning him not come back empty-handed. Number three gazed across the mountain along the rocks, between the mushroom desert and cliffs, as there were tracks in the soil, comma it seemed like ropes had been dragged through different parts of dirt, which occasionally plotted between the rocks. He began to follow the strange tracks, also finding a few large paw prints mixed in too. Some time later, he found another skeleton with another broken weapon, and he was sure that Jay chose to walk along the mountainside, rather than through the desert or the forest. And it made sense to the mage hunter, too, comma, the rocky terrain was much easier to cross than the other two. What caused concern in the low-ranking mage hunter though was the dead skeletons he kept finding along the way. Sure, it was good to find them as it was a trail towards Jay. But it was also a sign that the necromancer was fighting something, and based on how some of the bones had been grinded to dust, whatever it was, was powerful. Time was of the essence. Rather than a search and secure mission, it was turning into a rescue mission instead. Tilda 3rd Academy, Mirror Reality number 34 Tilda. Matheson groaned, waking up with a splitting headache, still having the ability to sense mana. Arg, what the fuck did they do to me he thought, a bitter frown as he sat there, still dazed and a little confused. Matheson, or Smiley, was alone again. Having passed out a few times from random claps of pain, it seemed like he had stabilized somewhat. For now at least. Finally, someone entered the room again. Fuck, that girl again. He thought, staring at her with death in his gaze. It was that girl who caused him so much suffering. The one who did something to him something he would have to undo, if it were even possible. Smiley both feared and hated her at the same time, and he deeply desired to pierce her heart with his sword. Well, looks like you're doing better. She smiled, don't worry. You won't be paralyzed anymore unless you misbehave anyway. She shrugged. Smiley stared at her with anger. So she paralyzed me. Or she has the power to. Somehow. Due to the intense pain, he had completely forgotten about the worm which entered his body, comma, the same parasitical worm, which was now coiled around the nerve bundles at the base of his skull. All of those painful memories had been stashed away somewhere, buried deep in his subconsciousness. Smiley continued to angrily stare, grinding his teeth as another person entered the room. An old man with a jolly expression and a long beard greeted him. Both the old man and the young girl were smiling. But Smiley sensed no danger from behind the elders. Hello, and welcome to the third academy. Here's the situation, comma, you're not supposed to be here. Though due to some uncertain events, you are. Plus, I'm told you snuck in here. And we were thinking of executing you. But we have decided to have mercy since you're so young. But since you are here, and sending you back would be annoying. You will now be working here with us. Norgrim said as if it were already a done deal. Now. I'm sure we'll find a way to make use of you. But for now, I believe we need some mage assistance. He added, also, don't try to harm anyone or we'll be forced to execute you. He said it so casually. But a shiver went down Smiley's spine. Something in his voice told him to beware. That many had been executed before, and that many more would be to come. By the way, this is a permanent position. He nodded with a smile. Chapter 218 the mage hunter, currently designated as number three, continued tracing the signs of the necromancer along the desert. He must be smart. He didn't leave any tracks in the sand at all, despite all the tempting red fruit around. He thought, copying Jay and not leaving any tracks of his own. Number three was standing over a small pile of skeleton corpses, comma four in total, each with broken weapons by their side. Their bodies had mostly fallen apart, having lost most of whatever dark energy was holding them together. 
After relaying a report back to base, both he and the other mage hunters on the other end of the communication crystal were sure of it. He had found the trail to the necromancer. Strangely, there were only rope-like tracks and a few old skeleton footprints which were barely visible, sometimes showing up in the dirt between the rocks. Somehow, the young human necromancer didn't leave any tracks himself, which is what made the mage hunter worry, comma, what? If this was all just another diversion, not leaving a single track didn't make any sense. No one was this good, especially not a level 9 adventurer. Lieutenant Marsh had since sent another squad towards number 3, an additional 6 men to the two others, which were already heading towards him, and number 3 was glad to have reinforcements coming. It meant that responsibility for the necromancer wouldn't solely be on himself. Usually with responsibility came rewards. However, three knew better than that. He wasn't an idiot. If there were any rewards, a superior would claim those comma and if not his superior, then the superior of his superior. Any merit owed to him would never reach him, and so he knew that there was no point in putting in too much effort. Just the bare minimum would do. The lowest amount of effort to stop himself from being punished. It was a sad reality to live in, and he hated it. It was often small things like this which stopped entire nations from prospering. Knowing reinforcements were coming, he kept moving, following the strange tracks on the side of the mountain. As he walked, he unconsciously sped up, as the skeletons he found were getting more frequent. Tilda Hollow, F-O-R-E-S-T Tilda. Jay found a small tranquil stream running through the forest. Ah, so refreshing he released a satisfied smile. Sitting by quiet stream. He wiped some water on his face, rejuvenating his skin after the strange, dry, desert micro-environment. Surrounding him were thick ancient trees that covered the forest floor with interweaving roots. The roots themselves covered in thick moss. Small colorful mushrooms jutted out from decaying leaves and logs, and Jay was already sick of seeing mushrooms. So he casually kicked them over at his own leisure. Unfortunately he couldn't identify them, and after talking to hunters during his time as a butcher, he learnt that usually these bright colored ones could kill a man with as much as a pea-sized bit of its flesh. Still, he was feeling quite relaxed in the forest, as he knew there were no other beasts around. It was a quiet moment of safety, and perhaps clarity. Since the blood vine bear had a large hunting area, he knew he was safe as everything had already been slain by the blood beast. Basically, the forest here was his to do as he pleased in. There were no dangers and no threats. Of course, he still headed south, but he made his skeleton carry him on his throne, with a more slow and relaxed pace, giving him a more comfortable ride on his throne. His throne still used the same chair, though, instead of cutting down trees for support carrying poles, he simply crafted more bone spears. Lying back on his throne, Jay felt free, in a sense. His eyes were lazily half-opened as he lied back on his throne, starting at the sun peeking through ray cracks in the forest canopy above. After escaping the beast, he really just wanted to forget about everything for a moment. And he needed some time to decompress after all the events at Losla. But he still had notifications to read. Jay nestled his head back lazily into his chair as he began to open them. Your skeleton had died your skull. Yeah, yeah. Tell me something I didn't know, he said. But he was even more annoyed with the next notification. 3. 240 x. Jay furrowed his brows, only 3000 x for a level 27 beast. What the fuck? His calm mood was turned sour, feeling quite annoyed as he sat in his throne. Surely there must have been more x, where did the rest go? It doesn't even compare to some other monsters I've killed comma and without any help from. Just as Jay was about to say it, he realized what happened. I did get help those damn mushrooms. He frowned bitterly. After a few moments, he seemed to come to his senses. I guess without them, it wouldn't have died anyway he shook his head. So this is what sharing exp is like. He frowned, it's no wonder everyone else is so slow at leveling. Since Jay and the mushroom biomass were not in a party, the exp was not shared evenly, comma, the majority of it went to the mushroom field, which did the majority of the damage. Maybe I'll come back and kill those damn mushrooms someday I'll add it to my conquest list. He nodded. I guess first I will need to start a list anyway. Maybe I can make some shovels and dig up the whole desert. With the skeletons it shouldn't be a problem. He smirked. With his anger quelled, Jay checked a final notification. Skill discovered. 
Mass summoning. Immediately his mood brightened up. Oh. He grinned, opening the skill. Mass summoning. Comma can summon multiple skeletons at once. Comma can create a mana well within a pile of bones. Skeletons will continue to resurrect until the mana runs dry or the bones run out. Comma requires free skeleton slots. Does not sub-resurrect. Amazing Jay's eyes sparkled with delight. A mana well. Awesome. As he continued to read though, he paused and couldn't take his eyes of a specific part of the skill. What does it mean by sub-resurrect? Sub. Resurrect. So my summons can summon two I'm guessing. But how? Jay looked at his skeletons carrying him, thinking about it some more. I don't see why not. I mean, they have mana. Necrotic mana. And I copied the Scrinshaw skill from them hun. He read the skill over a few more times. Comma right now, the skill wouldn't be useful, since his skeletons were already alive. But it held exciting implications for his future. We need to get you guys leveled up. As Jay said that, Lamp and Sweeper gazed up at him, their heads both turning back to look at him at an unnatural angle. Jay simply looked back. What? The skeletons went back to looking ahead, carrying their master over roots, and between the ancient dark trees. Weird. He thought silently. As Jay was carried, he chewed on some jerky he had saved, but he made sure to savor every bite comma this would be the last he had for a while. At least until he could find some meat and construct a smoker. His other rations were odds and ends he had stashed away comma some dried fruit and forest nuts. They wouldn't last for long. I'll need to send the skeletons hunting soon. But we will still need to travel out of the blood vine bears territory. Otherwise there probably won't be much food at all. He shrugged. But if I leave its territory, then there might be other beasts. Stronger beasts. Jay frowned in a predicament comma albeit a self-imposed one. He wanted to keep traveling south. But right now he was in the safe territory of the blood vine bear. There could be more dangers filled with stronger enemies ahead. At the same time, there was no food in the blood vine bear's territory as it had used its blood scent skill to pick its land clean of any flesh or blood. Well, I'll just make a decision when I get to the edge of the vine bear's territory. I can just send the skeletons out of the territory to hunt anyway. And if they die I'll know it's not safe. He nodded. It was a simple solution, though based in inexperience. Apart from the time he traveled to slay Leech Queen Rosa, he had never done much survival in the wild. Back then, he had packed enough food to travel and never did any hunting himself. Thankfully, his skeletons were proficient and murderous machines. All along the way he had left a trail of death. The local wildlife decimated by the merciless undead. Typically, survival in the elements was hard and could be just as dangerous as the monsters he fought. However, Jay had his skeletons to do every single thing for him, comma, hunting, gathering, and with mines, he believed he could even teach them to butcher. So Jay both underestimated how hard it would be to survive in the wild and seemingly would never come to realize this fact, thanks to his tireless helpers. With his mind made up, he sunk back into his chair again, trying to relax, if only for a moment. Ah, this damn itch he grimaced as he went to scratch it more. Chapter 219 Jay just wanted to relax his eyes, if only for a moment. After spending a few hours at the stream his energy had recovered, but mentally he felt quite drained. The stress had built up, and not knowing what lied ahead only added to it. He had only fled from Losla for a little under two days. But to him, it felt like it was never going to end. Now there was an itch on his arm, a nagging feeling holding him back from truly relaxing, stopping himself from feeling at ease. It would have been akin to sleeping in a bed filled with sand, comma an impossible task. Damn it. Fuck. This fucking itch. He thought, scratching his arm. Finally, he took off his molotus coat, ready to give his arm the scratch of its life. However, what the fuck? His eyes widened, staring at his arm. On his arm was a large saw, a bubble of flesh which had some green life forms in it. Each of them looked like pieces of grass, about as long as his fingers. Gazing at it closely, he prodded it. This only made him panic further as the little green slithers inside began swimming around, responding to the light poking. Oh fuck, oh shit, oh fuck, close quote. He quickly pulled out his sword, and was about to pierce the bubble of fluid-filled flesh. But at this very moment he was forced to stop. As if responding to the threat, the little green things turned towards his flesh and attempted to burrow into it, causing great pain and trembling in the rest of Jay's arm, which quickly spread to his body. 
Gritting his teeth, he lowered his sword. They sense me. Maybe I could just cut my arm off. He thought, besides, I've healed from more threatening injuries. Somehow though, the thought of carrying out the task brought even more pain with it, another wave of pain traveling across his body. The pain was not just from his imagination, but a response from the creatures living in his arm. Somehow, they sensed that he meant them harm, and as his body shivered again, he almost fell off his throne. The pain was so great that time seemed to slow down, and in that moment, he wished for nothing but death. And after giving up the idea to harm them, the pain suddenly stopped as if a switch was flicked off. Jay gripped his chair, his nails digging into it. Fuck he had a cold sweat. While he had been stabbed right through his chest before, the pain from these tiny parasites was otherworldly incomparable. It made being pierced through the chest with a giant stone sword seem like nothing but an ant bite. Somehow the parasites in his arm ramped up the levels of pain as they responded to the second time he threatened them. After some time, Jay got back to his senses, and knew he still had to take them out of his arm. Somehow. Okay. Amputation is not an option. He breathed for a moment, then continued to stare at the bubble of liquid on his arm. Stop. He commanded his skeletons as his throne came to a stop under a more lighted area. He stuck his arm into one of the endless shafts of light peeking through the trees. Under the beam of sunlight, Jay watched it for a while. The little green things inside went back so sitting calmly under his flesh. Dormant. Inactive again. It's like they're waiting for something. It's like they can sense what I'm thinking. Maybe I can sense what they're thinking. They at least can sense the outside world. Outside of the flesh boil they're living in. Somehow. For a moment, Jay even wanted to learn from them. To take some time to copy their abilities. But he pushed that thought away quickly. Comma in his list of priorities his life came first. Then research followed afterwards. But what are they waiting for? He made a thoughtful look at them. They didn't appear to be feeding on him, or growing, or reproducing. They were just strangely dormant. For now they weren't harming Jay, comma as long as he didn't harm them anyway. It was only part of his skin around it which was slightly inflamed and red that made it itch. But after removing the Molotus coat, it was beginning to stop being red. It was almost like the Molotus coat sensed a threat and was trying to attack it, to consume it in whatever way it could, but also couldn't hurt its master. After calming himself down, Jay decided to lovingly stash his poisonous coat away in his inventory. He knew it meant him no harm after all. Next, he planned for a future operation, one which would be more barbaric rather than surgical or clinically clean. If these things were going to attempt to consume him, his arm would need to be cut off, comma, but he wouldn't be able to do it. And neither would he be able to command the skeletons too. Not the skeletons without minds, anyway. If he did command them to cut his arm off, then the creatures in his arm would cause him excruciating pain, and he would be forced to command them to stop. The ones with minds could be a different case though, as they could think for themselves. At least to some degree. His plan, give one of the larger skeletons a mind, have it learn of his parasite, and eventually he would command it to chop off his infested arm, no matter what he said afterwards. Perhaps not directly to chop off his arm, but along the lines of protect me from any and all threats. He also thought to give it a command to ignore his commands, if his life was in danger, if it meant saving his life. That way. Hopefully, the skeleton would carry out his orders, even after he asked it to stop. Even if he screamed at it to stop. Then, when he asked it to stop, the squirming creatures may not react and cause him pain. Meanwhile, the skeleton would carry out its task and remove them, along with his arm. Possibly, it was all just a theory anyway. Plus, in Jay's weird and curious mind, it would be an interesting experiment. Would his skeletons override new commands in favor of an older one, or vice versa? As Jay thought about it, he wondered where he could have even acquired this little parasite from in the first place. He remembered it was itching as he walked along the desert, but even before that there was a slight itch. There was no itch before he fought with the Pearton wolves in the dead of night though. Perhaps, while I was sleeping, he guessed. For a while, he was asleep while Pearton wolves descended from the skies around him, being chopped to pieces by his merciless skeletons. Thinking about these little green worm-like parasites crawling out of a disemboweled corpse of one of those flying underground wolves and crawling into his skin, made him shudder in disgust. Hum, in the desert it burned, perhaps it hates drier air, he thought. Perhaps it loves moisture, 
Jay made a thoughtful look at the stream. He was being carried along it, as it too flowed south, and he figured it would be good to have a water source. Jumping off the throne, he leant down and placed his arm in the cool, gentle waters. Ah, close quote, he smiled. As soon as he dipped the boil in, a wave of relaxed pleasure washed across his mind. It felt good. Too good. Way too good. The little green things in his arms curled into little balls, as if responding to the cold. Comma though it seemed like they were now releasing something into Jay's blood, to make him feel warm and dazed and completely euphoric. He waited for a while to see if anything else would happen. But there was nothing common nothing except the nice feeling of warmth wrapping around his mind, somehow getting stronger. Perhaps I can cut them out now he thought. But just as he brought his blade closer, he stopped. Strangely, there was no pain as he thought about harming them. But he stopped. But if I cut it out, the nice feeling will go away he smiled dumbly. Maybe just a little longer. He nodded. Jay slowly dropped from his knee to a more comfortable position. And was soon lying on his stomach. Maybe I'll just wait a bit longer he smiled. Soon enough he was lying down next to the water, looking at the little green worms in his arm. I guess they aren't so bad. Once you get to know them, he smiled, his eyelids starting to close. The little green worms were still cold up into balls within the large boil on Jay's arm. Each of them releasing something into Jay's blood which was making him feel amazing. Better than amazing, comma, it was intoxicating. The colors of the forest somehow seemed more colorful, the mushrooms especially, which seemed to almost glow. It was like his eyes had pulled back a layer of reality, and was looking at a more vibrant world. Each of the ancient interweaving tree roots he was lying on seemed like a grand puzzle made by some renowned architect. A divine tapestry woven for a wood eldritch lord. His eyes were seeing patterns he had never seen before, and somehow he felt like a piece of the puzzle. Amazing. He smiled. Suddenly, he heard what sounded like a glass smashing somewhere nearby. Comma looking around for a moment he was startled, and thought it must have been the skeletons. But there was no glass anywhere. Did I imagine that? He wondered. Then another thought popped into his head. No, it's fine. Everything is fine, just rest. He agreed with his own thought, yes. Just rest he smiled, nodding, agreeing with himself. Confused, he told the skeletons to defend him and went back to lazily relaxing on the edge of the stream. The skeletons left the throne and formed a defensive circle around their master as they stared into the forest. Slowly, his blinks became more slower, his eyes opening less than they used to. Soon, his eyelids grew much too heavy, heavier than they had ever been. Finally they closed. I'll just mmm he released one last satisfied hum. Sleep. You're safe. I'm safe. He thought to himself. One last nudge was all it took and in utter euphoria, he finally fell asleep. His arms still floating lightly in the river, bobbing up and down gently as he lay there on a bed of roots in hollow forest. Chapter 220 Number 3 was the closest mage hunter to Jay, and felt like he should have found him by now. Even he was surprised a level 9 adventurer had this much endurance. Number 3 trudged through the boulders, dirt, and over the rocky terrain on the side of the supreme mountain range. Clouds seemed to pass over it high above, each of them speeding overhead but resoundingly quiet. Following the trail of dead skeletons and strange tracks, he finally came to its end. He began to analyze it as if it were a crime scene. Four skeletons put up a fight here. No more tracks along the mountain. Finally, he noticed something under the curtains of tendrils hanging from the mushrooms. Bones in the desert. But why cross here, of all places? He wondered. The desert had no tracks in it as there was movements under the sand, constantly shifting it around. The little lizards plucking the fruit were still hard at work, and destroying any signs that someone went across the desert. Any signs except for the pile of bones under a large mushroom in the center. Instead of pursuing immediately, number three first took something out of his inventory. Channeling some mana into it, he placed the strange item on a rock. It was a fist-sized black sphere with a red band around it. After a moment it began to hover in the air, and a red beam of light shot out of it. Number 3 turned it to face across the desert, and left it floating there. It was a beacon, a marker, nothing special, simply a way for the other mage hunters to follow in his footsteps. So far, he had guided the others by telling them he walked along the side of the mountain, between the cliffs and the desert, but now he was going to need his beacons. While walking along the desert he was traveling southwest, 
but his beacon pointed southeast across the desert, which is where he was headed. For a moment he simply stood there and gazed into the forest on the other side, wondering. Number 3 couldn't help but wonder why Jay crossed here, of all places. It made more sense to him to keep following along the easy terrain on the edge of the desert. Because of this, he was having a hard time trying to get into the mind of the young human necromancer. As far as he could tell, Jay's behavior was both calculated and erratic. Blind, but mindful. A part of him still doubted that he was even following Jay since there were no human-sized shoe prints, just skeletons and odd markings. Perhaps the bastard's hiding in the cliffs, laughing at me. Maybe he's not being pursued by a beast at all. He started wondering, thinking that perhaps it was all an elaborate ruse. The long journey seemed to be weighing on his mind as well, making him more paranoid than usual. Number 3 had no just been tracking Jay for the last day and a half, but spent days marching to Losler from the capital to Comoran without any rest. Being awake for nearly a week may have been okay for his level 48 body, but his mind still needed rest. The subtle signs of madness were beginning to show. After deploying the navigation beacon, he began his trudge through the desert. His armor boots sunk deeply into the sand with each step, and the weight of the rest of his armor made them sink halfway up his calf. The powered armor suit itself was heavier than any human could bear, heavier than 10 humans combined could carry, but with a supply of mana and the adventurous strength of a level 48 soldier, it was manageable. The mana kept it moving without much effort at all. As he trudged through the sand, some small lizards caught his attention as they began to harass him. Number 3 glared at them in disdain through his helmet. The little things were attacking him with something which was leaving hardened red plaques on his sacred armor. Pests. He grunted, raising a foot high into the air. He channeled some mana into the suit, and it responded in kind with explosive power. He brought his large boot down with so much force that it caused a shockwave to travel through the sand. A wave of yellow hot sand shot out from around him like a wall. Even the rocks on the mountain trembled. Nearby lizards were crushed and shocked to bits, while ones further away were stunned for a moment. The sands around him were stained red, with himself at the center of a shallow hole. Number 3 kept marching through the desert, but it seemed that his problems weren't over. The dead lizards attracted even more lizards, smelling the scent of blood. Before he could even make it halfway, the dead lizards had already been consumed, while a large group of lizards were now charging at him through the sand. I should have just jumped over the whole desert, he thought, though first he had to investigate the bone pile in the middle. All the way, the lizards were attaching the hard red plaque to his armor. To even number three's surprise, it was difficult to stomp off and remove these weird chunks of red material. He could remove surface level chunks of it which were sticking out and not attached very well. But the deeper parts underneath seemed to fuse and harden, solidifying even further, making them impossible to remove. Three didn't swing his sword at it though, since it was obviously a sword. It wasn't the right tool for the job, and his military training wouldn't allow him to blunt his weapon on such a thing. The harder red plaques would be removed after some grinding or chiseled away, when he returned back to base, by some lower ranking soldier. Perhaps a town guard, or even a peasant, would be forced to do such a duty. But not him, and definitely not his sword. It was below him. Number 3 was smiling slightly, imagining the poor bastard who would have to clean his armor. Every time another small red fruit burst onto his boot, he smiled more. After all, this wasn't a life-threatening situation, it was simply an annoyance. Unfortunately though, some were even added to the very base of his boot, and soon it was like he was walking with balls attached to his boots, which served to slow him down and throw him off balance. Finally though, he approached the bones in the center of the desert, where he saw the pile of bones. A few more broken bone spears were near the pile, each of them forged somehow into long smooth shafts. Each time he saw them he wondered how it was possible that bone was formed into different shapes, or even what creature it could have come from, if it wasn't somehow formed. Staring at the bone pile for a moment, he was glad that he didn't find Jay's body there, so he kept tracking him, looking for clues. After tossing through a few of the bones he didn't find anything of interest. More bones were strewn between the forest, and where he was standing now too, so there was still a path at least. The others will find this, he thought, leaving the bone pile behind. As he pushed through some of the hanging tendrils, 
he suddenly felt something tugging on him. His instincts kicked in as he did a backward slash with his sword, while using a movement ability to dodge whatever attack was coming. In a matter of seconds even more sand was kicked up into a wild cloud of yellow stinging sand. The power from his sword slash alone made a dust cloud as his movement ability didn't activate, due to there not being any attacker, comma a requirement for the defensive ability to activate. Looking at what was tugging on him, he seemed confused, and even a little foolish for responding with such a threatening attack. Mushroom, he thought, seeing one of its tendrils tugging harmlessly on his shoulder. Chapter 221 One of the tendrils was tugging number three's shoulder, somehow stopping his large war machine-like armor from moving. Must have got caught in the armor, he guessed as he went to sever it with his sword. The sword was so fast that it caused a silver flash. Sand was blown away from the speed. Unfortunately, as he swung his sword, the mushroom tendril strangely slid around the blade. The tendril was completely unaffected. It was like it was both rubber and a thick steel wire, holding him in place. Number 3 frowned. He had seen things impervious to melee attacks in dungeons before, so he guessed this must be something like it. Of course, a mage hunter was prepared for such an occasion. Lifting up one gauntlet, a segment of his armor folded back, revealing a small hidden compartment behind it, holding two small blue beads of gemstone. They seemed to shine, almost like a storm was brewing under the surface of them. Channeling some mana into his armor, the blue beads floated and left the compartment before they attached to the tip of the thumb and fingertip on his glove. Seeing that everything was in order, he closed the armor panel, and then channeled mana into them. The precious blue stones glowed brighter until finally a blue arc of crackling energy linked between them, releasing a loud crack like a lightning bolt between his fingers. After a moment, the arc of energy between them normalized and was ready for use. Despite being small, it hummed with power fiercely and sparked brightly, creating shadows of the mushrooms around him even in the sunlight. Slowly, he brought the arc down onto the tendril, as it wickedly crackled between his fingers. Even then, the tendril resisted for a moment before it sizzled, bloated, and melted all at once. The tendril was easily cut right before it even had the chance to begin to reel in its victim. Number 3 quickly stored the precious blue arc stones away, stashing them back into the hidden armor compartment, before attempting to pull the tendril out from his armor. Unfortunately, it didn't come loose. He guessed it was wedged pretty tightly into some small crack somewhere behind his shoulder as it simply wouldn't break free, and soon he stopped pulling, as he didn't want to risk damaging his armor. HMH. Another job for another peasant. He grunted with a shrug. If they made a mistake, they would be the ones to be punished. So if anyone were to damage it, then it was better off some worthless peasant suffer for it. So he thought, unbeknownst to number three, the tendril wasn't wedged into his armor at all. As he walked away, he was oblivious to a red patch of the fruit plastered right in the middle of his back. For now though, he ignored the tendril hanging somewhere off his back and continued his mission. Now he gazed across the desert as he stood near the bone pile as looked towards the trail of bones leading to the forest. That way, he nodded, stepping towards the forest. As he pushed through some more tendrils, he failed to notice the fruit again. Why would he be wary of the fruit anyway? So far, the only things attacking him were some strange lizards, adding red plaques to his legs, which were underground for the most part. This time, one of them attached to his shoulder and burst, sending the rampant red growth over his armor and solidifying. His military training activated again, and he swung his sword with a quick spin, ready for whatever was attacking him. Damn it, he thought. Sensing no danger, he took a moment to see what was no tugging on him, and as he suspected, another tendril comma though this time he realized it was stuck to his armor. This was not the only tendril now attached to him either. When Span and flashed his sword, he made a grave mistake. He had turned and shifted his body into even more of the fruit comma all of them attached to tendrils, and all of them sticking to his armor. Hum. A minor hindrance. He thought, though more annoyed than anything. Without panicking, he calmly opened a hidden armor compartment again, and took out the blue arc stones once more. These stones had to be mended by the armor after each time they were used, which is why they were in the compartment to begin with. Each of these were engraved gems, and having such tiny engravings gave them tremendous value. Usually a gemstone would be socketed into a purpose-made item to give the item various effects, such as flame, sharpness or even sense, but these were themselves the item and the gem, the power and the conduit. 
Only the mage hunters had access to such exquisite and expensive gems. Precious as they were, these arc stones were also fragile because of it, and had to rest inside a regenerative compartment built into the mage hunter suit. Number 3 worked quickly and diligently, hoping he would be able to cut away all these tendrils before his arc stones would need to be repaired by the suit. He didn't want to wait here for hours as they repaired, and it would truly be embarrassing if number 2 and number 4 caught up to him and found him in this sorry state. So he carried out the tedious process as quickly and precisely as he could. A few times, he did try to break off the red growths attaching the tendrils, but it seemed that these plaques were further enhanced by the mushrooms, which provided them with an unknown nourishment, and helped them to further solidify. About 13 of these tendrils were currently attached to his body, and unfortunately, each had to be cut. A few times he tried to simply tug at them, hoping that something would snap, but even the mushrooms seemed to be made of something much stronger than even his own armor, as they didn't so much as budge. He was sure now that they had a form of physical damage immunity, so his best option was to cut them. They probably became like this after rock slides, he guessed. Suddenly, the tendrils got shorter. He was only halfway through cutting the fifth tendril away, when he noticed that they began to pull on him. Despite his armor weighing as much as a house, they managed to tug at him without much effort at all, soon even pulling him off balance. He took a step forward to stop himself from falling over. But in the sand where his balance was reduced, combined with the large balls of red plaques on his feet, he had no choice but to fall into the sand. A heavy thud, and he fell to one knee. It was better than falling over completely. Taking a deep breath, he remained calm. He noticed ever more tendrils were just attached to his body as he was pulled into them. Looks like I'm stuck for now, he thought bitterly, seeing his five-minute jog just turn into a three-hour slog. Following procedure, he took out his communication crystal. Number 3. Environmental Hazard. Temporarily hindered. There's a beacon at where to cross the desert for 2 and 4. Acknowledged. Another voice sounded back. Hazard type. Obstruction. He replied. Acknowledged. Stashing away his communication crystal, he calmly went back to cutting. Unfortunately, he was soon back on his feet. Normally this would be a good thing, but in this case it was not because he was pulled to his feet. Still, through all this, he didn't let panic set in, comma, he simply tried to cut away the tendrils faster. However, the tendrils kept pulling. Slowly, to even number three's surprise, he was pulled out of the sand. While it made it harder to cut, he ignored his current predicament, and calmly continued to cut with a cold efficiency, hammered into his mind and body, through his years of training. More tendrils were cut, but he was simply too slow. Before too long, his whole body was pulled tight. Channeling more mana into the suit, he even resisted it for a moment. But he soon decided to conserve his mana for the time being. There was no point fighting it if the result would be the same. With no way to continue cutting, he stored the arc stones in his inventory, as he currently couldn't place them into his armor. Thankfully, the mushrooms were not strong enough to pull his armor apart completely. After the mushrooms stopped pulling him in multiple directions, he found himself tucked under the mushroom's cap, strapped to it, as if he was a peasant in a dungeon. Hum. He angrily grunted for a moment as he wasn't able to do anything, but soon decided it was a hidden blessing. He could finally get some rest as he waited for the others to show up and cut him loose. As he hung there, he secretly rested his eyes under his heavy black helmet. Suddenly though, the mushroom began to move. The vine-like tendrils even seemed to loosen, comma though it was not setting him free. Fuck. The flesh of the mushroom closed around him suddenly, and instead of being pulled apart, he was now being squeezed inside its cap. In all this, though, he still didn't panic. He calmly took out the communication crystal and relayed another message. Number 3. Trapped inside a mushroom. Waiting for assistance. The mushroom had already closed and was pitch black inside. He didn't even hear them say acknowledged in response. It cuts off mana lines. He wondered, intrigued by the strange specimen he found himself in. Number 3. Need assistance. Please respond. He tried. No response. Next, he felt a fluid fill up the inside of the mushroom cap. He quickly put his communication crystal away to protect it, as he heard a familiar hissing and bubbling noise of corrosive acid. The tendrils burnt away, and the red plaques melted off. Thankfully, the fluid couldn't eat through his armor. It wouldn't be very good armor otherwise. Finally, he was free. Well, relatively free. Chapter 222. 
Free was an overstatement, comma, he was still trapped inside the mushroom cap after all, drowning in a syrup-like acid. Still, he looked on the bright side in such situations to mentally keep himself going. Nice to move again, he thought, gripping the wall of the mushroom and trying to tear away a chunk of its flesh, yet to no avail. In all this he had not panicked, but soon his own suit of armor which had kept him safe all this time, sent him a message which did. Internal air supply comma depleting. Air left. 1.3 hours. His thoughts began to spin rapidly in his mind. Fuck. How far away are they? No way to tell how far away they are. All I can do is conserve my air. He shook his head. I should have filled up my air reserves to the brim. Too late to think about that now. Save my oxygen or find a way out. Channeling some mana into his suit, he first tried to punch his way out. Cavities of air formed behind his armor-clad fist as the power and speed was so great as it shot towards the mushroom. Landing directly on the wall, comma, however, the mushroom didn't budge. Not one bit. It was like an immovable object. It was like a natural law. Physical damage immunity, he thought. Still, he tried his sword next, comma, also to no avail. Its surface quickly bubbled and turned a shade of reddish-brown, before he could even add it back into his inventory. For a moment he considered taking out his arc stones again, but since he was floating in acid, he thought they would surely either dissolve or have their enchanted engravings broken. Now, he had one option left, to wait floating in the pool of acid within the mushroom capsule. Without hesitation, number three closed his eyes and began to meditate, calming himself and slowing his breathing before successfully falling asleep. Some time later though, he woke up. A few hours passed and he managed to make his air last longer, but not long enough. His breaths were getting more and more strained, faster and somehow feeling more empty. Each of his fingers tingled while his head felt like it was getting heavier. Fuck. They didn't make it in time, he thought, not wasting his breath on words. He was out of time. He couldn't tell how much time he saved, but it didn't matter now anyway. Regretfully, he took out one last item from his inventory, Comma the only one he thought which could get him out of this. He didn't consider it an option before as he wasn't this desperate. The item in question was a strange weapon he picked up from a traveling merchant many years ago. It was pitch black within the mushroom cap, but he felt it in his palm, channeling some mana into it. He then threw it down comma as fast as he could in the thick syrup-like acid within the mushroom. He pulled himself upwards to the top of the mushroom and waited until, boom. An unbearable pressure spread across his body. Despite being in his armor his body shook wildly, the vibration felt like it had shattered his bones. Thankfully his helmet was made sturdier than the rest of the armor, and his head was spared from most of the impact. Much of the explosion was contained in the mushroom head, so he had absorbed a lot of it. After a few moments though, his body healed as some of his health was drained. While his armor was heavily damaged, he didn't care as long as it saved his life. Thankfully. It seemed to work as the liquid was draining out of the bottom of the mushroom, comma though was quickly replaced as the mushroom simply produced more. An exit he thought, quickly pushing himself down. His plan worked. He pushed himself to the bottom, and soon pushed his leg out. Dying for air, he kept pushing desperately, and soon the other leg came out. Unfortunately, he soon couldn't push anymore. Something below the mushroom was blocking his path. What the fuck? He thought, still straining to get air. His lungs felt like they were about to collapse. He felt like his consciousness was about to slip away. Adding large amount of mana to the armor he continued to push and made it a little further. But there was just not enough strength to push through the mushroom cap. Why he thought, now panicking as he was on the verge of a coma. The elemental bomb should have. It can't. Looking down, he realized something else was wrong. It was still pitch black even after his leg poked out of the bottom into something blocking his way. But it was still daytime. It didn't make any sense. With an oxygen depleted brain, he couldn't figure it out. Nothing seemed to make sense anymore. A few more shallow breaths and a few more pushes was all he had left. With no mana left and barely hanging onto consciousness, he finally gave in and passed out. Stimulants activated. Huh. He took in a large strained breath, then another and another. His eyes were bloodshot and red, his mind sprawling with confusion before he passed out again. Stimulants activated. The process repeated itself. Stimulants were injected a few more times, only resulting in him passing out again. It was like torture. Finally though, after another round of stimulants, 
he never woke up again. The mage hunter was dead, comma, but his suit was not. User status, comma, deceased. Other suits undetected. Sora protocol activating. Respond to disable Sora protocol. A few moments later, Sora protocol activated. Three minutes remaining. Deep in the sand, under the earth, within an acid-filled mushroom cap, a timer slowly and quietly began to tick down. A dead mage hunter in a suit of armor responded to no prompts. As the timer ticked away, the outside world completely oblivious. 2. Reached the tip of the desert. Found the skeleton. Waiting for 4, then we will proceed along desert. Negative. Keep moving. Number 2 paused for a moment. It was unusual for his commanders to abruptly change his orders. Acknowledged. He said, storing away his communication crystal before he kept moving. After walking for a while longer though, he felt something was wrong. The wind seemed to go quiet. For a moment, reality seemed to pause. The sun disappeared as new shadows formed from a stronger source of light. An eruption of violent noise and light and trembling happened in the distance. The mountains trembled and the skies split. A deafening noise was followed by a hot wave of concussive force. It was a sight he had not seen for a long time. Two didn't duck behind a rock or run for shelter though, even as molten boulders and burning debris were thrown at him, comma, all of the light crumbled as it met his unrelenting shield. He guarded himself as he waited for more debris to pass by, some at lightning speed and some falling from the sky. His commanders were a day's journey away and on the other side of a grand mountain range. But even they would have seen the light, heard the noise, and perhaps even felt a tremor. So he knew he would be contacted in a short moment. Reports an angry voice growled into his mind. Taking out the communication stone, he shielded it from any stray debris before replying. 3. Seems like 3 activated the Sora protocol. The mountains responded to the explosion, and large rocks and boulders had began tumbling down towards 2. Taking out his shield, he braced for impact while protecting his crystal in his other hand. He expected to hear investigate being yelled at him next. However, it seemed that they weren't sure what to do, comma, that Lieutenant Marsh wasn't sure what to do. Did Jay really cause a mage hunter to activate the Sora protocol? Surely it wasn't because of the level 9 kid. Number 2 thought. A house-sized boulder thundered down the mountainside and smashed against his shield. It didn't crack into two, but instead rolled right over him. He shrugged it off as if it were nothing. Investigate. The voice hastily spoke again, adding three encountered an environmental hazard approximately two hours ago. An obstruction. No other communication since then. Two had a questioning look on his face, but decided not to say anything. Acknowledged. He grunted, slamming a smaller boulder away with a shield bash. Two decided to burn through much of his mana as he sprinted along the edge of the desert towards the crater left by three. The Sora protocol had been activated, and contrary to most opinions, it was used as a form of information control, of all things. The mage hunter suits themselves held secrets, advanced technology, advanced hexamistry, and hundreds of years of research. Though on the outside they often looked like chipped or worn armor, made from a sort of dark lustrous stone, each of them were technological masterpieces. And some would even say part of the reason humans were not yet extinct. Environmental hazard he thought, staring at the mountains, the mushroom desert and then the forest. All three of these seemed as questionably dangerous as the others. He knew that it was safe next to the desert, so he ran forward. Soon enough, he came the crater left behind. Seeing how deep in the ground it was, he could only guess that it was underground. A lot of the desert sand was streaming into the crater, while oddly, many mushrooms were left standing, their caps undamaged, despite being so close to the force of the blast. The edges of the crater had turned to a black tarry glass, still flowing slowly. The bottom was already covered with sand, which had since flowed in. The explosion had created a divide in the desert, splitting it into two comma the crater itself was about as wide as the desert. Number two quickly make a report. Two, Sora protocol confirmed. There's nothing left but a smoldering crater. Again, he waited for a few moments as his commanders decided on what to do. They were most likely consulting directly with Marsh at this point, since a mage hunter had died under his command. Eventually a response came though. Three was crossing the desert following the tracks of Jay. Continue tracking Jay. It's going to be hard since everything was fucking blown up. Two thought. Acknowledged. He said. Two slowly walked away from the crater and took a gentle step into the desert sands, his heavy armor sinking into the sand. 
With every action he acted paranoid as he was trying to not become the second mage hunter to die today. For a moment he watched and waited. Nothing. Next, he prodded the mushrooms with his shield. Nothing. He took a few more steps in and stabbed his sword into the sand. Nothing. If there was a sand beast of some sort, that explosion will have killed it. But three said environmental hazard. Two began marching slowly. He wasn't sure if there was some trap under the sand, but remained cautious with every step. Finally, he bumped against a mushroom. The damn thing attached its tendril to his foot. Damn it. He tried to hit it off with his shield, unsuccessfully. Over the next few minutes he discovered the same things three did. It was impossible to cut with a sword or pull off. Arc stones worked to cut it, but was slow. After cutting off a tendril, two didn't proceed. Instead, he experimented. He was not going to repeat number three's mistake. Some fleshy bits of a creature had left blood stains in the sand at the edge of the crater. So he quickly went back there and dug it up. A bloodied lizard in hand, he journeyed back to the mushroom and tossed the lizard's dead body onto the fruit. He shook his head disappointed in three as he watched the mushroom fold up with the dead lizard and disappear underground with a small prize. What an idiot, he thought. Two, number three was killed by mushrooms. Before waiting for a reply, he quickly added not poisonous mushrooms, but man-eating mushrooms, impervious to physical damage. Brief four when they arrive, a commander said, acknowledged. He nodded, waiting for four. Chapter 223 Boom exclamation point tilde. A wave of pressure rolled through the forest. But its only living inhabitant was shocked awake. Ah. What? Jay raised his head off his arm, still asleep on the edge of the stream. Since he was lying on the ground, his whole body felt the tremor. And it was enough to startle him awake. What the fuck am I doing he said to himself. Get up, he thought. Noticing his arm, he quickly remembered. The little parasites in the boil were still curled up into little balls. Thankfully it seemed that they had used up all of their reserves of whatever they were pumping into Jay's blood, and he felt mostly normal again. Physically normal anyway. Mentally, he was bitter, angry, annoyed, pissed off. Much more than he should be. Jay let his anger out. Well, what the fuck are you waiting for? Pick up the throne and keep moving he bitterly spat orders at his skeletons. As he went to sit on his throne, after a few moments of being out of the cool water, the parasites in his arm, unwound and went back to their long linear forms, but were neither causing Jay any pain or any euphoria. Little fucking shits, he glared, making me sleep on the cold ground. And what was that noise that shook the earth? Following the deep booming noise traveling through the earth, some more sounds followed, coming from somewhere north comma where the mushroom desert crossing was. The sounds of a large rock slide came from the mountain range. Giant boulders the size of houses tumbling down the mountain and crashing into each other, splitting apart or being split apart. Jay only barely heard the crashing boulders. But compared to the deep boom which shook the earth before, they were of no concern. He couldn't figure it out, and his strange hangover was only making it worse. Ah, fuck it. Fuck everything. He angrily said, who cares anyway. His anger was seemingly out of control after he woke up. He wasn't sure why, but neither did he care. Burn the forest down. A thought popped into his head. Hump, burn it down. Well, that might be fun, but it could give away my position. Plus, I wouldn't get anything from it in close quote. Burn it down. His own thought interrupted his other thought. He just reasoned with himself, but it was like a different part of him didn't care. No, I'm not going to burn the fucking thing down. He told himself sternly, shaking his head. What the fuck is wrong with me today? For the next hour, Jay continued to argue with his own thoughts. Argue with himself. Every time, a thought would pop in his head telling him to burn down the forest. Or thrust his arm back into the water to feel amazing again. But after some time his thoughts became more sinister. To turn back to Losler to massacre and pillage. Kill Devon. He thought that perhaps he was going crazy. His own thoughts wouldn't stop yelling into his own mind. He almost felt like his brain was getting hotter from all the thinking. He tried to close his eyes and just be still for a moment and relax. But his thoughts only got louder and more demanding. Slowly it was like he was being mentally drained from arguing with himself. A part of his mind just wouldn't shut off. What the fuck is wrong with me? Gritting his teeth in anger, he jumped down from the throne and pushed his arm back into the water. For a small moment, he felt good again, a small relief. His anger was gone. His thoughts became quiet again. With a sigh, 
he jumped back onto the throne, and had the skeletons continue. Soon enough his anger was gone. However, his own thoughts began to rattle his mind again, even yelling at himself in his own head. It was tolerable at first, but after another hour it was annoying, then another hour, and soon enough he was gritting his teeth in anger. Oh, just shut the fuck up, he yelled at himself. Have I lost my damn mind? He asked himself. For whatever reason, he felt like his thoughts were more clearer if he said them out loud, and he had noticed a strange pattern. Some of the other thoughts he was having were simply okay at first. Eat all your rations, thrust your arm into the river. And then, he would reason with himself. I will need to save those four later. And no, I need to keep moving. It was somewhat mentally exhausting arguing with himself though. But that wasn't the problem. His thoughts would become more evil, more crazy. Send skeletons to kill peasants. Kidnap. Burn. Punish. Slay mercilessly. Even though he reasoned with these thoughts, they simply repeated themselves, and kept repeating themselves until he was screaming at his own mind to shut up. Did these worms do something to me? He wondered. Suddenly, he had a thought about the worms. A few thoughts. Kill them. Eat them. Burn them. Cut yourself. Jay paused for a moment, a confused look on his face. I just thought to harm the parasites and nothing happened. He quickly drew his sword and thought about cutting his arm off comma however, the parasites quickly gave him a shot of warning pain. Ugh, fuck. I won't then, don't worry. He shook his head and the parasites stopped the pain, storing his sword away. He realized something strange though. If these parasites sense my own thoughts when I want to harm them, and they harm me in response, then before when I thought to kill, burn or eat them, the parasites didn't harm me. So either that means those erratic thoughts are undetectable by the parasites. Jay felt fear rise in his heart as he realized. Or those aren't my thoughts or the parasites. At this moment the voices in his head started yelling into his mind trying to distract his train of thought. But if that's the case, then whose, or what, are they? The other thoughts stopped. His mind returned to silence for a moment. But only for a moment as they returned even louder and angrier. Burn. Kill. Slay. Destroy. Steal. The thoughts rang through Jay's mind with a commanding anger. It was so loud that Jay was shocked. He even covered his ears with his hands. But it didn't help a single bit. What the fuck? No. Burn. Kill. Slay. Destroy. Steal. Harm. No. Just fuck off. The voices continued to yell through his mind. So Jay gathered his own thoughts by speaking out loud. They're not my thoughts. Somehow they're in my mind. How are they getting in? They must have entered, somehow. So how do I get them out? Jay felt helpless. Whatever this was, he had no clue how to deal with it. It was something he could barely even describe. Something immaterial. Detached thoughts, disembodied voices, I wonder if they have a soul. Jay began to smile as a spark of hope rose in his heart. Suddenly, Jay used his own ability on himself. One that he had not used for quite a while, simply because of the dire warning it came with. The last time he used this ability, he felt like something was fighting him, pulling the soul upwards, and strangely he felt like he committed an offense of a higher power. It was the strange ability which he had only used twice, and only had two clues. Soul sense. Left bracket grasp the intangible. Left bracket offend life and death at your own risk. Grasp the intangible. Jay sighed, surely if I use it on myself, it won't be an offense to a higher power right. Burn, kill, destroy, steal. The voices continued screaming in his mind, comma, right up until the point Jay activated the skill. As soon as he did, Jay himself felt a sense of fear, though he someone could tell it wasn't coming from himself. Somehow, he could tell that the voices in his head were trembling. When Jay used the ability on himself, he felt his own soul nursed above his heart as if it was sitting on a throne. Apparently his mana was too oppressive as he felt like what he was doing was simply wrong. There was no pain, but more of a sense of utter emptiness and aloneness, when he applied too much pressure to his own soul. Relieving it, he felt much better again. Next, though, he sensed other things. Something which he couldn't describe, though compared to souls they felt different. They felt wrong. As his mana wrapped around each of them, the voices said nothing but he could still sense their fear. He was just glad they were finally quiet. It felt peaceful. He even just stared into the forest for a moment not thinking anything. 
I bet people take their quiet minds for granted. He nodded, I probably do too. Three of these invisible and intangible entities were attached to Jay, each having bodies like snakes which were aligned along his spine, their long bodies calling upwards around his head and then entering his mind through the middle of his forehead. You, right into my damn head he thought, feeling disgusted. What are these things? Jay paused for a moment, but realized he didn't have time to be flustered. He focused and began the removal process before whatever these things were could hope to harm his mind or even his soul. First he detached the tail of one of them from his spine as it seemed to stick to different parts of his body. Almost like it was plugged in. As he went up, it required more mana to pull away. But it was manageable. Compared to wrestling a soul from whatever higher powers were above though, it was much easier and used much less mana. So he wasn't worried about running out of mana before the process was over. The first of three snake-like creatures had its body removed, and now it only attached to Jay through his forehead. Taking some inspiration from the parasites in his arm, he rolled its body up into a ball, and then thrust his mana out with it, away from his head. It took a second attempt, but after adding enough mana he pulled it out. Thankfully it was painless. The strange intangible creature was helpless against his power. Jay wondered where all its strength was. It couldn't even move its body. This was insulting to Jay, to think that such a weak creature had tormented him for hours. Sneaking into his mind, mimicking his thoughts, trying to convince him to do evil things, and then screaming at him. Such a weak creature dared to bark orders at him. He was now as offended as he was annoyed. Since he was sensing it with his ability, he couldn't actually see it. But it basically felt like a snake, with some strange nodes along its body which he could tell were thicker, filled with some sort of energy comma the same nodes, which seemed to plug into Jay's back somewhere. Though it wasn't a perfect fit and seemed wrong, unnatural. Well, I can't hold onto it forever, Jay shrugged. Now, what was it saying before? Destroy, burn, slay, hum. Good advice. He smiled with the eyes of a predator, using his mana. He mercilessly twisted the strange creature's body into all sorts of shapes. It was powerless against him. It was a bad day to be whatever this creature was, as Jay was not just trying to kill it, but releasing some of his stress, and even practicing his mana manipulation on it. It shriveled up and was crushed. It was twisted mercilessly. Finally, its body was torn apart. Jay released a little stress as he made it suffer. Strangely, something felt right about killing it. It was more than simply justice being carried out, but more like judgment, or even like he was a harbinger of destiny. Strangely, as it died, something like a soul but smaller than one was left behind as its body disintegrated. Then another, then soon about 15 of these small half-souls came out of its dying body. Jay didn't let a single one escape. This time though, there was no force from above fighting him to lift the souls upwards. The non-souls were just simply there, uncared for, alone. Weird. It seemed that whatever force above wanted nothing to do with these fake souls. Jay released his grasp on them, and slowly, they descended like falling pieces of pollen. As Jay's concentration was on the parasite he ripped out, the other two began to cry out again. Mercy, please, spare us. Send us into another creature that we may live. Jay ignored their pleas for help. They did not show mercy so he wouldn't either. He repeated the process with the next snake-like being, torturing it for a while, before ripping it to shreds. Each time, Jay smiled with glee. Something about killing these evil things brought him great joy. However, Jay was also annoyed at himself for not realizing it sooner. The evil voices in his head were not even his own. He though they were more like demons, though not an accurate term, it was close enough. They were at least like some sort of soul parasites feeding off evil or simply just there to torment him. As Jay removed the third immaterial creature, he felt the last group of the non-souls fall into the cold earth. Compared to his own soul and the souls of others, theirs felt like empty, hollow, smaller, wrong. If I were a better person, perhaps I would have sent them into another creature if there were any around. He shrugged, but based on them falling into the earth, it seemed that they were destined to be destroyed. Killing them now really didn't change anything. Afterwards, he focused his mana around his forehead comma the spot where these creatures, these demons which pretended to be him, somehow entered. Unlike the rest of his flesh where there was like a subtle barrier, here there was a hole in the barrier, 
and coming out of it was something like a tree, or a whirlpool. It was like it was pulling in something, not mana, but something, perhaps information. Damn it, how the hell do I fix this he frowned. For a moment he felt hopeless, like somehow he had done irreversible damage to himself in a way which couldn't possibly be fixed. Will I have to rip out these soul parasites for the rest of my life? He frowned. Maybe the barrier will heal itself. Or perhaps I can just keep my mana there to cover the hole, until I try to sleep. His options were abysmal, simply treating the signs rather than the problem. Hopelessness set in. Suddenly, he received a strange notification, comma, one that disappeared as soon as he read it. Your seal has been healed. Beside me there is no other, above me there is no other. Mercy comes at a price. Forgiveness has a price. My seal has been healed. Jay felt a drop of water travel across his brain, and mind, comma, instantly his hopelessness was turned to joy. Strangely, it made his head feel cool and refreshed as opposed to feeling hot and irritated like it was before. He couldn't help but smile as his heart also seemed to respond with joy. What was that? Compared to the way the parasites in his arm made him feel, there was no sedation, and he didn't feel dirty, but his mind felt more clearer. He felt like he had woken up from a deep sleep and was filled with energy and life. Using his mana, he found that there was no hole in the barrier anymore. What is going on? Jay felt like he had perhaps won the blessing of a higher being Comorant by the sounds of its brief message. It is the highest. Chapter 224 The forest was as quiet as ever, the only sounds coming from the clinking bones of the skeletons, and the odd snapping of a twig. Jay was still being carried on his throne above the forest floor and the plants below, each hiding different ticks, insects and other parasites under their leaves, waiting to jump on a passerby to suck their blood or eat their flesh. Most bugs and parasites lacked red blood, and were therefore spared from the blood vine bear, comma though they lacked creatures to feed on as well. Jay looked at the boil with the little green things still in his arm. Ironically these little invasive creatures had saved him. Thankfully, they were still in their dormant state, and so he let his thoughts drift elsewhere. My seal has healed forgiveness comes at a price. Jay continued to think, looking thoughtful. First he was assaulted by strange thoughts, and then a notification that disappeared as soon as he read it, followed by an incredible feeling of a drop of water refreshing his mind. The whole experience itself almost didn't feel real. Nevertheless, he went through it, analyzing it systemically. Those thoughts even sounded like my own having my own voice. The only difference is, they quickly became more and more evil, wanting me to do vile things. And before that I was passed out. Hum. Before I passed out, there was the glass smashing sound. The smashing glass sound was the one thing he remembered vividly in his euphoric experience. The only thing which stood out, as there was no one else around to even smash a glass. Following that was him waking up afterwards and hearing the extra voices in his head. Waking up that's right. Something jolted me awake, something powerful or did I imagine it? Hum. Jay scratched his chin for a moment. Sweeper, head back Jay was about to send a scout to investigate the booming noise. But decided he would need a more stealthy approach. Wait Sweeper stay here. Duck, head back to the loud noise and investigate. Don't be seen. While Duck may have not been more stealthier than Sweeper. It did have one advantage, a mind. It was a harsh training method, but it would either be stealthy or learn how to be. The small skeleton nodded and dashed off into the forest, easily vaulting over the large root systems weaving across the forest floor, as it sprinted towards where the earth-shaking noise came from, comma, though it did look back at Jay once last time as it left. Oh, Jay smiled. I think it wants to stay he shook his head, feeling a sort of bond with his assassin skeleton. Duck didn't know what investigate meant, but it would have a look around for its master. Jay simply planned to use the host skill to take a look while using Duck as his eyes, but for a moment he wondered if he could even look through the eyes of a skeleton with a mind. Hum, it should work close quote, he thought, but to make sure. Jay activated his host ability on his only other skeleton with a mind. Heavy. Heavy was trudging along the side of Jay's throne, nurturing its thick shield, periodically using it to swash away the old plant, which defiantly sprung up between the tapestry of ancient roots. Jay decided it had a lot to carry already, so he didn't make it help to lift his throne, and there were not many plants to cut out of the way here, as everything was either covered by roots or shade, stopping or stunting the growth of many of the forest floor plants. 
As Jay used the skill, everything went black again. And then the world returned again in black and white. Jay didn't try to do anything. And Heavy kept trudging on Comma not realizing its master was looking through its eyes. Jay felt strange as he was both using the host skill and was also not controlling the skeleton. It was like breathing, comma, your body will breath on your own, but you can control it too. Apparently, Heavy didn't even realize Jay was in its head until Jay tried to move. When he did control its body, it was like normal. However, when he turned around and gazed at his body, something was different about him. Something that only made him as intrigued as he was confused. He stopped while staring at himself on the throne. In a world of black and white, Jay had color. A single color. The only color. An aura of deep green light radiated around his body. He was like a glowing star in a galaxy of gray. He was the shining light of the skeletons. A green light, but still. Ending the skill, he woke up in his body again. Next, he tested using the host skill on another skeleton without a mind. And gazed at himself, comma, though he appeared normal. Black and white. Old. Looks like only the ones with minds see me with a green aura. He thought returning to his body again. He stared at Heavy for a moment, who quickly went back to marching. How very odd. He quietly said. Jay shifted in his throne and gazed back at the strange bubble of flesh on his arm. I'll need to remove this soon, he thought. But I think for tonight we will just keep moving. The forest was much cooler than the desert, and was getting colder as the afternoon sun began to touch the clouds, and turn the skies orange. The thick forest canopy above had made it much darker than it should have been. Jay took out the Molotus coat and wrapped it around his shoulder, preparing for the long march through the night. Before the sun completely disappeared, Jay decided to craft some spare sets of weapons for his minions, arming them to the teeth, before they would encounter the next enemy on their journey. It wasn't long before they were all armed again, comma all, except for Dark who was investigating the explosion. As Jay was carried along, it seemed there was some orange light up ahead. Coming closer he found that it was simply the afternoon sun, shining past the thick canopy of leaves, as there was a large circular clearing here. Dungeon entrance. Jay wondered, as came closer to the clearing, there were no trees around, and no roots dared to cross the circle. It was a ring of black soil with no grass, or weeds, no stones or rocks. Not even a footprint or a fallen leaf. No signs of life at all, comma, only the black soil. Jay thought it could be the blood vine bear's home, or lair, or feeding circle. But for some reason he knew he was wrong. S stop. His eyes bulged as he tried not to yell the orders, instead screaming them in his mind to the skeletons. They stopped just before any of them set a foot inside. The black soil circle somehow sent a wave of fear into his heart. The forest was silent as it was. But here there was an eerie silence. An ancient silence hung around the black circle. Even the vast spindling tree roots wouldn't venture into it. It was like the trees knew something he didn't. And now, as he sat on his throne at the edge of the circle, Jay felt like he was being watched. Some of the forest cast a shadow over the black circle. But strangely, the shadow which fell onto the soil was as black as night. No, darker still. Like an endless void trapping all light. As Jay looked away, something was moving in the darkness of the shadow on the edge of his vision. But as soon as he looked back for it, all he saw was darkness. Ugh. He gritted his teeth trying to remain quiet. A pain shot into Jay's arm, comma, the parasites. Didn't like whatever this was either. Jay trusted the parasites. They had a strange sense for danger too. I need to leave. Now, he thought, gritting his teeth and ordering his skeletons at the same time. He quickly had the skeletons to turn around and move directly away from the black soil circle. He had them running now too. The fear he felt was so intense, he felt like it would follow him forever. That nothing would be able to stop it from finding him, comma, whatever it was. With an unknown primordial fear gripping Jay's heart, he even thought for a moment that he should head back to Losler and let the mage hunters catch him. But he quickly pushed the thought out of his head. Jay couldn't help but look behind him as he was carried away. He took out Deathwalker's sentry as well, yet it didn't sense anything. He even controlled his breathing to try and sound quieter. Something about whatever he had just found sent a fear deep into his heart. Like he had seen something which his eyes were not meant to see. It was a fear he didn't understand and couldn't explain. Maybe something intangible. He thought, wrapping his mind with a coating of mana to try and protect it. The skeletons seemed unaffected by it. 
though comma perhaps because they were immune to fear. All of them were as happy to carry Jay into the sacred black soil, as they were to carry him away from it. We'll go around it far around, he thought. Glad we didn't step foot into the soil. I feel like it would have been a violation, an offense of something ancient, something vengeful. He couldn't be sure of course, comma, there was a chance it was just a strange circle of black soil. However, his intuition had began to scream at him. It like it was yelling danger. Only after five minutes of having the skeletons rush him away, did he now realize his heart was beating wildly. Hopefully I didn't offend something he thought, trying to get his heart back under control. Hopefully it will let me go. Whatever it is, he shivered for a moment. Once he was back into the deeper shaded parts of the forest, he felt some relief as he could no longer see the orange glow of the sun in that perfectly circular clearing. The fear also dispiated and his heart and breathing both went back to normal levels. Jay backtracked north, then went far to the east before heading south again. He used the sun as his compass since it set in the west, so finding which way to go wasn't hard. Jay believed he was getting closer to the edge of the blood vine bear's territory, so he decided to camp for the night. I bet the blood vine bear stayed clear of that part of the forest too. Jay thought, and since it didn't kill the blood vine bear, perhaps it won't hunt me down and kill me. Whatever it was, or is. While he would have liked to continue traveling at night, he didn't want the skeletons carrying him into something like that black soil circle, while he slept on his throne. Eventually, he found a natural cradle of interweaving roots, surrounded by three ancient trees, each of their trunks as wide as a carriage, which formed natural walls on three sides. Compared to camping anywhere else, it was only slightly more advantageous. Looking up into the tree tops, he wondered if anything dangerous could be lurking up there, but he still had not heard a sound, not even the chirps of birds coming into spring. So he assumed the blood vine bear had picked these trees clean as well, comma, both birds. Snakes and sneaking threats in the tree tops had become water for its hungry blood vines. Hum, this place looks as good as any, he thought, but hesitated before stepping off his throne. Jay suddenly grinned with no one around. I can finally camp the way a necromancer should. Hi guys, it's me again, the silent rupter. This is the end of this video. Hope you enjoyed so far. I will upload one last video after this one. That will conclude this series. Have a wonderful rest of the day. The silent rupter out.